Is uh, can Neville participate? Is he able to participate? Otherwise, she can pull. Yeah, uh, Neville, uh, can you let us know that you're online, please? Uh, Neville, you're going to have to acknowledge that you're online uh, for us to get the meeting going so that we've got a quorum. Hello. You may want to uh, delay the start just for a little bit. Okay, Neville, um, and Len, we can hear from you. We're, we're going to have to delay the start, uh, so we'll come back on at about... Uh, uh, 12 minutes after, I would say it around uh, just be just before uh, 5.15. Oh, so. there he is. No, he's, un he's unmuted. I never if you'll acknowledge you're there. Did you mute him? Okay. Did you, um, did you not mute him? Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome to the February 6th Committee of the Whole Meeting. And it is 5 12. And we have some feedback. Yeah, Houston, we have feedback. Yeah, I'm doing it. That's me. Proceed. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order and the adoption of the agenda. Any changes, adjustments to the agenda? Do we had public participation? Do you need it? Okay. <laughs> Any objections on that? Um, Anything else? Um, I had not had time to get to the package we got yesterday, so I'm not in a position to approve minutes. Um, what about others? I'm not, I'm not either. I think I'm saying, do you have anything to do? No. Okay. I, and I, I, could I just speak to the agenda generally here? Uh, yes. So, um, just a few observations. You know, we are fortunate to have an informed and engaged electorate in our community. And it seems to me that during a budget process, especially where public engagement is vital, um, we have a responsibility to accommodate this obligation to residents. We've now had a number of meetings at different times and seen residents show up. I see we've got more here tonight than we have previously, but uh, this is to be clear, um, Although it's a committee of the whole, it's a regularly scheduled meeting of council published in our yearly calendar and as per requirement must begin at 6 or 7 per p.m. as per our procedures bylaw. Uh, and to facilitate public engagement, any open portion must begin at 7 as per precedent, practice and reasonable expectation of residents. Um, I'd say don't let anybody tell you differently. Our CAO was made aware of this last week and yet here we are at 5 p.m again, without a provision for public participation. I know what it's like to be on the other side of this table and outside this room. I showed up plenty of times to speak at the last council. It's not always an easy thing for residents to do, um, but luckily for me, the last council provided a forum um, in that respect and for my letters to be published and I compliment them for that. That's how it should be. Us here today, I don't think we're doing so well. Um, and don't even get me started about correspondence that never sees the light of day. I think we need to do things right and do it by procedure. I think there's an important principle at stake here generally, and it goes to the heart of our obligation to residents, and it's one I take seriously. And for that reason, I cannot approve this agenda in principle. I'm sure others will, but uh, that's my position. And I would just say, for God's sake, let's please start doing things the right way. Okay, thanks, Councillor Reuter. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, through the chair, I believe we we talked about uh, earlier Starks um, in in a previous meeting, and uh, while there was quite rigorous discussion about it, I think we did agree up until this meeting uh, that we would would have the five p.m. start. So um, that certainly is my recollection, and and. Uh, so that after after today, I think we recall that that um, um, one of the con concerns was that Councillor Cunliffe um, <clears throat> would find it challenging to be here before six, and she had indicated that she would not in fact be able to be in this meeting. That's what I remember specifically. Um, so anyway, I I, I certainly um, you know hear the concern, 
but but I don't think there's been any uh, anything untoward happened here at all. We we've uh, agreed to try to get started earlier, to have Folsom and and uh, a discussion, and uh, I think after after today we certainly may, may wish to not meet ahead of the six o'clock time the timeline that we've talked about. But certainly today was was uh, was consistent with the a number of that we had set up. Okay. Well, um, I'll be much more succinct than the other okay. two. Um, I was one of the ones that probably confused the last meeting. I thought we were talking about special meetings starting at five, not regular meetings. I do agree with Marcus. The regular meetings should go back to six and seven the columns. Oh, yeah. Special oh. meetings we can talk about. All right. Okay. Uh, my understanding was that this was a committee as a whole, and, and I think uh, our CAO, uh, Mr. Blackwell, had made it clear that. Uh, unfortunately, this council has struggled over the last year, and uh, we haven't kept up with the business of the village. So we've fallen um, very much behind, and I think this was an effort by our CAO uh, to try to help us get caught up as a committee and as a council. So I was very much on site. I think that as a council, uh, ideally this, this year that we're in, we're already two months into this year, uh, almost two months. I think we've got to focus on the business of the village. And Mr. Blackwell, can you please give us a little further explanation of why we've started this committee of the whole at five versus seven o'clock? Sure. So um, the simple answer is uh, budget discussions are inherently complicated. Uh, there is typically council takes uh, a full advantage of the full evenings that it has, uh, which at normal start times, it takes council fairly consistently to 1030, which is the latest council can go. Uh, it's hard for people to absorb information, process information, reconcile information. So it's just good practice in my experience to uh, sort of deal with these complicated matters, which is the budget. It doesn't extend to other items necessarily. Uh, earlier to ensure everyone is kept as fresh as possible, make sure the decision making is optimized. So this is for uh, the intent of this is for uh, the benefit of council. It's not to hinder or compromise anything, it's to help. <clears throat> but of course, all of these decisions rest solely with council. I can always provide advice based on my experience, which is what I do and what I'm asked to do, and what I'm expected to do. Um, and that's what I have been doing. If council doesn't like that advice, it's absolutely free to follow whatever you choose to do. Okay, uh, with that, uh, with the change to the agenda, public part adding public participation, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Uh, second. And, and remove the meetings and the minutes? Uh, I'm fine with the minutes. I've read them, but the... I'm, I'm comfortable discussing the minutes, yeah. I haven't read them. I haven't read them. I haven't read this package at all. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, there's uh, four councillors here. So if two of them read them, uh, they won't be approved, obviously. So uh, I guess we'll eliminate them unless there's any other complaints yeah. or adjustments. So okay. come up to the next committee of the whole meeting then? Yeah. 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 Okay. All in favor? To the minutes, to the, the, uh, agenda. To the uh, agenda. agenda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those opposed? Proposed. Okay. Motion carried. Okay. We'll move right to uh, unfinished business. Uh, public participation. I'm sorry. Uh, those in the gallery, any comments? No. Okay. Online. Do we have anyone online? Uh, Norma Rogers, hold your hand up. Could you go to Norma, please? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. So I'm confused by the information provided on the budget supplemental form asking for council approval to borrow 1.35 million plus taxes to purchase a new fire engine. Under insurance implications, it is stated that engines under 15 years old receive 100% rating. Engines 16 to 20 years old receive 50% rating and must be used as a spare or in support only. And 20 year old engines receive 0% ratings. Our fire engines are 14 and 24 years old. However, 
According to the Fire Underwriters Survey, small communities with populations of 1,000 to 30,000 are approved to use fire engines up to 20 years of age for first line duty. Also, it states that due to municipal budget constraints within small communities, equipment may continue to be recognized for fire insurance grading past 20 years of age if annual tests deem acceptable mechanical condition. So you will see where my confusion arises from. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll have the fire chief. Uh, the fire chief is going to be speaking uh, uh, a little later to the supplement, so uh, we'll defer that. Um, we, yeah, we'll, we'll call on you in a moment. Uh, okay, any other questions? No other questions? Great. Okay, we're gonna move right to the uh, staff and the uh, fire chief will invite you on. Uh, fire chief, don't shy. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, I guess. Uh, uh, Chief, are you going to uh, just walk us through the uh, supplements? Sure. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll answer that question just posed. Sure, I think uh, I'll go straight into the the biggest bill of them all, which is the fire truck, which uh, was uh, brought up just recently. Um, the answer to that question, uh, in general, if you dig further through the uh, fire underwriter serve, uh, survey, you'll find that uh, it is highly recommended not to uh, attempt to use the truck after 15 years. They find that, um, uh, well, I know with a uh, 24 year old truck, that's out of the question. So now we're just uh, speaking to the 14 year old truck that could potentially be used for a few years more. That the uh, newest truck, our 14 year old truck right now, although it is in uh, good operating um, condition right now and we maintain it the best that we can, it will not pass a um, uh, the in-depth testing that uh, is needed to get that added 50%. Uh, the testing that is carried is not only kind of pump water, it's acceleration, it's braking, it's uh, frame condition, it's chassis condition, it's pump capacity, it's all these sort of things. And what uh, our underwriter survey is uh, saying with 95% of these applications to extend the life, the trucks don't make it to the as new condition that they need to be in to be certified to qualify to that level. So yeah, it's a possibility. Um, according to our underwriter survey, roughly 5% of the trucks that do undergo the uh, extenuating tent, um, testing will submit, but they highly recommend that um, the condition of the trucks, although mileage is low and that sort of thing, the truck go from sitting to 110% working, sitting to 110% working on and off, and it's very hard on the trucks, um, deteriorating them. And they, uh, they find that um, the majority don't pass the tests. So, yes. Do we do those yearly tests, or is this a, it's just when required? Um, I also, so there's just a, so I understand it. Is it an actual yearly test once it gets to the 15 years and beyond? Uh, yeah, yearly you would have to do it after that uh, 15 years, do the uh, the pump testing to, and then reapply for the, um, basically it's an exemption, or maybe it may not be called an exemption, but that those additional years, you have to have the yearly testing. Uh, we do do uh, the TPI inspections every year for insurance purposes and we keep everything legal like that. Um, but the extra testing for these extra years uh, is over and above uh, with regards to um, the level of testing that is required to then in turn get the 50%, uh, the should it be one of the 5% that uh, our underwriter survey has seen Pass to the as new condition or um, 
as described and as required to get that. So uh, yes, we could try it. We could spend uh, the money to have the truck tested and uh, go down that route and see how long it can, um, uh, if it will pass. And then we can try to do that year to year. Uh, but essentially that's, it's, we're kicking the can down the road. This, um, if it was gonna be something like that, we're not getting away from spending the funds. If we're gonna kick the can down the road, in my thinking, we should start contributing to a, a bank uh, saving up for these uh, potential funds. But of course, uh, you all understand that. The, um, yeah, we, we could try the testing. I am not overly confident that uh, it will pass to the level that is required to get the 50%. Yes, sir. So, yeah, just a point. I, I would presume that in the case of uh, equipment like this, that maintenance is absolutely job one, yeah. right? And to have a good maintenance and a good uh, relationship with a um, with, with a, a good mechanic that mm -hmm. I presume that's always important. Yes. Um, and so I I guess I'm not quite understanding if, if the maintenance has been done, I presume, mm -hmm. um, why we would be fearing that we might not pass uh, on the scheduled uh, areas where, where the truck needs to pass to achieve its, its rating? Um, uh, so a lot of the stuff is, um, reading the, the uh, underwriters, a lot of the stuff is uh, stresses on the chassis. Um, it's a uh, supply of parts because as these trucks age, they carry um, a specific amount of parts and they're just not available. That, <clears throat> that particular truck has, uh, uh, forgive my terminology if I get it wrong, I believe it incandescent lighting or uh, regular uh, 12 volt lighting. Um, whereas the new ones have um, LED. LED and lighter. As all the burnt out, this is burnt, we've had to swap in the LEDs where they used to be um, incandescent and that's, a little bit of the problem with electrical systems, we are having um, the odd occasion where we're sitting on the highway in a vulnerable spot with all the lights on, all of a sudden the power shuts down. And uh, so there's electrical gremlins somewhere in there um, due to the, well, all the work that's been done to try to keep these trucks running over the years. Um, there's the pump, pumps, uh, Pumps water fine. There's two stages, or uh, what's called a, a pressure governor, or a two stage pump. And what the pressure governor does, it'll either take a reading, like if I'm going to pump to 100 psi or whatever I choose to blow my lines, I can set the uh, the electronics to either read 100 psi, and if somebody opens or closes a line, the truck will already adjust to keep it at 100 psi or I can set it in what's called RPM mode, where uh, I'll take it up to the pressure I want, hit a button, and it's just gonna keep that RPM. Where that, uh, it, like, it's advantageous to have it in the uh, pressure mode, just because we're opening and closing lines, and as uh, uh, Carl Delia, as you open and close lines, pressure changes, so that truck can build up to the right RPM to supply the needed pressure um, is, is very beneficial doesn't work on ours. We have the pump in RPM mode. So that um, if pumps water, it's fine. We have to have somebody sitting by the truck and uh, running it, but it's in that RPM mode. If somebody shuts a line, then our pressure is going to go up because we're not supplying anymore. So now we have to dial back and catch the RPM and reset the RPM. If somebody opens, well, then we're, it's going to be low pressure. So now we have to dial it back up. So there's little, uh, there's a, a electronic, uh, issues not only with lighting, um, with um, pumping systems. Yep, we got lights on it. It works. It it's, uh, passes commercial vehicle inspections, all that sort of stuff. We maintain them as best we can. But I, I there, there's there's little gremlins in the details. Uh, those are a couple of kind of focused ones, but um, that. 
don't make me 100% confident that we're going to get the as needed by a fire under under survey to carry on additional mm -hmm. years of service. Okay, hey, any further questions? Yeah. Councilor Allen? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, Bert, I, I spoke to an insurance broker that we use since we came out of Canada, a really experienced, experienced broker, um, and all kinds of insurance he's done for us. And I asked him about this by underwriter survey. Mm -hmm. And he, he wasn't sure how insurance companies used it. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't sure if they, how they used it, if they even looked at it. But he said to me, there's only one thing they ask you about fire. Are you, I you, is, it, is it a fully protected, semi-protected, or unprotected area? Fully protected, he says, eight kilometers from a fire hole and a thousand feet from a hydrant. Now, I assume that means a functioning fire hole and a functioning hydrant. Yeah. But that's all the only questions they ask. So do, I'm not sure if you know the answer, maybe you do, but so what do insurance companies use this? Because there's been this out there, well, if you don't get this new fire truck, all our insurance rates are down. Yeah. So I sort of would do the math. Well, can I afford the insurance? Is that going to be cheaper than the rates going up? But we don't, you know, we don't want to find out a fire um, do you understand the connection between the two or not? Was that something that... like it's like like you're um, being exposed to by asking this fellow about this? It's a pretty complex system. I did the same thing. I asked my insurance broker, um, "What is it that uh, you guys know? Uh, like, how do you come up with these numbers?" And essentially, there's tiers of insurance. There's your regular ICBC front desk insurance person. Then there's somebody more experienced, and then it goes all the way up through. Um, and when I asked my regular uh, home insurer and uh, another member of ours, Captain, uh, well, one of our captains, uh, she did the same thing and she spoke uh, to her insurance and they both essentially came, well, the last, that basic question is fully or partially or, or not, and then they'll get a formula that they'll punch in the, the address, yes, it's fully, it's partial, it's whatever. And then they'll put it in their system and then a formula comes in that um, gives the rate or contributes to the uh, the uh, creation of the rate. It's that formula. And that formula comes from the fire underwriter survey that looks at uh, everything from the municipality's water. Uh, do we have a sustainable water system? Looks at the fire department. Do we have the fire department? Do we have training? Do we have public education? We look. Uh, they look at the type of buildings. Is it just uh, single family residential, or is it townhouses? Is it industrial and all this sort of thing? So, the fire underwriters actually look at the community in a whole, um, what the fire risk is, and all the stuff I've stated, and then they. Uh, I'm up, they factor all those things together, and of course, under the fire department comes all these things with which the truck fall them do. And the, the distance for the hydrants. And we have uh, this service. Um, we have functioning water. So the uh, I'm presuming. I'm just presuming uh, places like um, 
Stratton Point, Ocean Point, Montezamber that are in no man's land. They don't have a functioning fire department, but they're within, some of them have their own private hydrants. Uh, some of them have uh, uh, these different kind of parameters that the insurance people are looking for. Again, I'm, I'm guessing at where the two tiers come in, but the fire underwriters, there's the basic formula that comes from the fire underwriters. There's all the uh, brokers and brokerages underneath that then apply that formula to whatever the specifics are to their area, whether it be Austin Mines Bay or somebody south. Uh, and they compare those by putting in, are you fully serviced? Are you this close to that? Blah, blah, blah. And it picks out a number at the bottom. So, um, like I said, I'm not an insurance guy. I've tried to dig into this. It's uh, pretty complex um, or in depth uh, question for the insurance brokers that. Uh, uh, I've tried going through, like I said, my own personal um, insurance broker and then going straight to the fire underwriters and asking them uh, how it works. And they just tell me, well, we factor in all this, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, we come up with the number. The number is then used by insurance brokers in factoring your home insurance. Okay, well, how much does that make a difference? And they then you get the answer, well, it depends. It depends on your rating. It depends on this and that. And it probably depends on the three factors that uh, Councilor Abbott has spoken to. Chief, um, if we have some questions along the way, I know this evening is sort of you present this and we can answer some preliminary questions. If we have further questions, we, we can send you an email and oh, well, we get a response. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll um, any further yeah, questions just, this evening? Just before we move, move on, so just getting back to the, the small community. Now we've all seen this thing that Ross also sent it earlier today. Um, so the small community up to 20 years can be used for front line duty, according to this table, without testing. Is that is that no, your understanding as well? That's not my understanding. Uh, that that need to be says, um, I would have to double it again. Just, again. I don't so you can look at it afterwards. See, there's no asterisk next to that second line. It says small community 20 years and then below there. Okay. So what's a small community according to this? Oh, uh, well, like One less than 30,000 or something. Uh, we weigh under it. Where small communities are defined are incorporated communities that have a total population of um, that 1,000. 1,000 to 30,000. Yeah, we have over 1,000 population. Right, about 1,000 to 29,999. Yeah. Yeah. Rural areas are defined less, uh, small, medium. All right. And so rural right. areas are defined as incorporated or unincorporated with a total population of less than 1,000. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, perfect. So maybe that's it. I mean, if we need to confirm this later, but I think before we ask this to council, we should understand whether the 20 year limit is true, not the 15 in your small community. Okay, Mr. Blackwell, can you give us background? This is for information tonight. Yeah. We're not, we're not looking for a decision. No, I said so before we come to the next meeting. Yeah, yeah so we could, um, I would say absolutely. I mean, the, the big challenge for <laughs> council is, you know, it's not it, it's a question of when. And how prepared does council want to be for the day that a, a new track is needed, whether that be next year, whether it be five years, whether it be 10 years, you either save as much as you can going off in the future. So how I read this is that there is the ability to extend it to 20 years, but that needs to be clarified as stated just to make sure we know that, that that's accurate. <laughs> but regardless, we still don't have 1.3 million or whatever the case may be in the bank. And by the way, in five years, it's no longer 1.35 million. It's probably perhaps substantially higher than that. So council, uh, um, you know, that quick, I did a quick count, uh, calculation when I showed council or Abbott and, uh, you know, based on the current value of the truck, which is 1.35 million. So the, um, a few seconds, uh, comment on that, that is going for a bare bones off the shelf um, truck from a, uh, a purchasing agent uh, that I guess it's almost like a co-op. It's called Canute that purchases you. They said uh, base truck, base truck, base truck. That is currently the lowest price for a base truck right now. That base truck is still a year out in manufacturing. So if we order today, it's not coming till this time next year. Um, there's very little room uh, for um, a 
adjustments and specifications? There is a little, so it would probably take us a couple of months to come up with the exact parameters of what we want, and then a year after that. So we're looking, if we order today, it's a year, and a year, year and a half out. And um, so, so where I was going with that is um, based on, just based on, just to stick in the, or in the water, based on a 15 year lifespan, it's different if it's 20. Uh, based on that price, 1.35, whatever it is, that's about $90,000 a year. Council would have to set aside every year for 15 years if it wanted to reach that $1.3 million mark. In 15 years, however, the difference in the cost is different and it's going to have gone up. So it may start for the first few years of 90, then you'll have to go up to 100 in order to, to uh, catch up. The, of course, the other approach is to borrow. But that is a jerk off. We'll talk about the various options when that time comes. So just one one final question. Have we ever and uh, have we ever funded any of the apparatus uh, through rents in this community? Not to my awareness. Uh, yeah, the last truck was uh, in part uh, grant. Was it? Yeah. And that was yeah. 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 So that seems to me would be a, a good thing to look into. Absolutely. Man, okay, uh, two, quick quick points. Points. two quick points. Um, I, this would be helpful if we had a sense of the cost of the uh, testing. And a second thing would be whether the standards that, that this truck was built to in 2010, mm -hmm. um, whether the standards, what the differences in standards is probably a little tougher for this truck to meet, to meet the the standard if the standard is improved. That's, that's a thought I have. Uh, so it, it, I'd be interested just to know the cost of the testing. Um, and if, if there are likely there is one in 20 of, of that going through, although I want some, want some clarification on the 20 year matter as well. Second point I have though is the uh, the impact of, of um, the preparation the community does in terms of fire safety. And with the uh, uh, well Paris that we've experienced and so on, I think that's something we need to look at very carefully too in terms of impact on, it's not, it's not a, a fire truck mm -hmm. issue, but in terms of, of uh, looking at all the different things that we need to, to, to think about, um, whether there's some investment we need to make in fire safe as well, and, and whether you know, we may be, may be investing uh, more money here in fire safe may, may be a better investment than the Councilor yeah. Rosen, um, yeah. thanks for that. If you can answer these questions quite quickly and then we'll move no, through because no. I think we're going to run short of time for the I don't think those answers right now. Okay, if you want to start smart real quick. Okay. I applied for a grant and it's going through where I signed off on the paperwork that was done. It's gone for approval. It should pay for both uh, uh, equipment training, um, a uh, community fire smart uh, uh, coordinator, and some um, uh, critical re um, infrastructure mitigation. So um, coordinator will come and educate. Mitigation will uh, chop down and do some landscaping around critical infrastructure, and then uh, tools and training uh, in addition. So that is uh, in a grant right now that uh, pretty sure is going to be approved. It was uh, I signed it today and uh, sent the final thing in. The testing and the current standards, I'll have to, the cost of the testing and the current standards, I'll have to get back to you with. Secondly, with uh, with that, sending these trucks out for testing, uh, that's, we're sending our newest truck out, the one we're talking about. We then don't have a truck in the village. We have a 24 year old spare that is not uh, qualified to stand. So sending these trucks out um, leaves us Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chief, thanks for, for the explanation on the fire truck and uh, that gives us a lot to think about. Uh, we've done the item. Okay, just, just one comment. Uh, that, that grant for clearing around infrastructure, we got that two years ago. We've done that work. Uh, I've, I've seen that done. You aware of that? Okay. Yes, that was done. Uh, like there's, uh, it's it's okay, as long as you're aware, we have done that once before. Yes, it's been done in some places, but there's other secondary. Okay. Okay. 
So we've got the backhoe, the pentalon, cutters, the member housing, and support vehicle. So Chief, I'm gonna pass it back to you and, and we'll okay. run through those. Uh, next one uh, is, is there a particular order you'd like to go? No, just no. Uh, we, we've got it in the order of backhoe, pentalon, cutters, okay. oh, uh, member housing. Uh, backhoe. backhoe. Yep. Okay. So up at our, um, uh, at our training facility, uh, well, let's uh, back it up a second. The majority of our calls as found from um, records from our uh, Surrey Fire Dispatch and our um, FPM, we went to more car accidents than we did anything else um, last year. So not just because of that, but because of the high standard that we hold for auto extrication, we do a lot of training uh, with regards to auto extrication. The um, we get multiple vehicles to cut off, and that's we're going to talk about the pencil on uh, cutters as well. But where this uh, uh, forklift or backhoe uh, comes in, the current forklift that we have to move those cars around and put them on their side or put them on our roof for training purposes and that is a 1946 uh, forklift that came from uh, the marina was uh, in a it was purchased and brought up. There are no parts for it. Um, it needs a power steering pump. It needs brakes. Uh, it's 46 years old and it's had a, had a hard life. It is a danger to use. Um, I'm the only one that drives it just because I don't want other people in it. Uh, on occasion, um, the training officer will do a couple, uh, a couple of moves. So, Myself and the training officer are the only ones that use it. We have to crash into these volunteer truck um, or donated vehicles to get things stopped or fully eagerly. It's not a safe vehicle to be using uh, for doing this. So what we're looking for is a replacement piece of machinery, either a backhoe or another uh, forklift that can uh, operate on gravel. Um, and we believe that we can find one by auction, a used tobacco or a used forklift for under the $40,000. And then that'll permit us to continue doing the training that we've been doing and need to maintain our skills and uh, uh, to carry forward. So that's uh, that request um, is for either a backhoe or a um, a forklift that can operate basically off grounds in the uh, gravel, um, rather. Okay, that's sure. Oh, um, and would that also be able to be used or shared with public works? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nobody's in a silo here, so we can share it if uh, public works needs it. We could use it for that. Um, yeah. Is this public works existing back there not capable of doing this? So it is. Um, I think there would be a reluctance to provide the backhoe in case it's not there when we need it, or in case it got broken, um, and then would be down. Do we need two backhoes? Probably not. So, I mean, there may be a scenario where we could come up with a way to do the work on the problem is, you know, there has to, has to be a highway license because it has to drive from where it's kept to where the training scenario is. That's the, we haven't talked about it uh, very much. So, yeah, I think we've got a new fancy trailer. Mm. Was it not moving the back of that around? No, that's for moving the excavator and the skid steer. Mm. Uh, the, the, the back of it has a license plate. Right? It has a license plate. Yeah, it has to be escorted on the highway with, with the flashing light right. front and back. Um, we also, of course, have a forklift, which is also which is functional when it's functioning. Was it off road gravel? No, no. It's for finished surface only. Yeah. The forklifts quite heavy, and the second you get that gravel wet, it just sinks. As we know all too well, so yeah, no, it's not off road capable. Um, is it a possibility with the deck over? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the skid steer might not. I think we'll, uh, just brainstorming right now, we would need to purchase forks for your backhoe, from what I understand, because your backhoe does not have forks. If it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, if the skid steers, they, uh, 
If you put uh, the weight of a vehicle and left it with the skid steer, the skid steer is topple. Um, they don't have the little. Why don't you two get together and see if there's another option? Yeah. For the sake of time, like at uh, that point, right. let's take that offline. So, uh, sure. next item. All right. Uh, you guys have the Pantalon cutters? Yep. Yes. Okay. As uh, vehicles get better and better as they go, they're safer and safer. Uh, what that means is the, the structures for the, the cabins themselves, they're being encased in iron steels, uh, boron, um, what we call tailored blanks, which are super strong uh, structures to, to maintain them. All well and good for uh, the patient, and they have crumple zones and all that sort of thing. The problem is, they if you're un uninjured, great, okay, we can take our time, get you out. If you're injured, they're super difficult to get through. Our, um, these uh, pentalon cutters, uh, they have a higher cutting tensile strength uh, to throw out some, some ballpark numbers. To cut a, bor a piece of boron side impact beam, you need 217,000 PSI of pressure to snap those, uh, the boron side impact beams. Our current cutters go to 221,000. So we're just barely making it with the uh, the cutters that we currently have. The electric um, uh, pantalon cutters, they have a higher uh, cutting rate, cut force, PSI force, as well as they're, um, they're just more manageable. They have, uh, as the name implies, they're battery operated. Everything is in, um, in, in your hands when you're using it. Our current cutters are a hydraulic system that have a, a gas uh, motor with a hydraulic pump, then we have hydraulic hoses, then we have um, the cutters themselves. And they get maintained yearly, they get um, uh, serviced yearly, and they are great tools. We will probably get some trade-in value from it. What I can say the trading value is, I have no idea, but we will probably get some trading value. So this price probably isn't what we're going to, but um, uh, the reason for these cutters, they are stronger, um, stronger uh, cutting potential, stronger uh, jaws and spreaders. We want to get in the, the future as well um, to deal with the modern construction of the vehicles. And, the as our current inventory as we're servicing it it's a gas motor it's a hydraulic pump it's not getting any stronger year to year to year to year so those brand new specs are getting lower and lower and lower um and this is uh i believe the way to go for um the future um, of uh, auto education is all these electric tools any any grants that you know of for these or uh, not, that I know, not that I know of right now, uh, we'll always be searching for grants yeah. and um, when we hear them, we'll jump all over them, but nothing that I know of right now. Okay. So, yes, sir. Question. Oh, um, you, you talk about the stronger materials. I mean, um, I'm a little confused. Uh, I had the misfortune of owning a 72 Newport um which stressed the uh yeah. flatbed that took it away on its uh, yeah. uh to its final grave um that thing was a tank uh i i mean my observation of modern cars is that they're tin cans yeah. aluminum you can open up up with a with a with an exacto knife it seems to me so where yeah, yeah a can opener yeah. yeah so um how how is it that they're more difficult to get into so the uh car technology today is incredible um, we go through uh, Auto X every year. Um, the, uh, the the front of like I think it's the Fords. It's numerous. The engines are designed to on uh, a front end collision where your Newport would have a solid steel frame rails, solid bumpers, no no give whatsoever. It weighs like a tank. Bang, you get that, it gets transmitted all the way throughout the, the cabin. You get whiplash and hit the steering wheel, break your ribs, all that kind of stuff. These new cars, yeah, their bodies are tin cans. Their bodies, you can basically use a can opener and get open. 
The uh, the engine compartments, the front uh, front ends, they're all designed to absorb pressure. So they they feel flimsy. They do that. The engines are designed to break off their mouth, go underneath the car, and have the body go over top. The actual cabs, the uh, framework, there's the A post, B post, C post, uh, sill, um, uh, the dash bars, and then across the back of the C post, they're all hardened materials. Your side impact beams are now these hardened materials to protect that cabin. And um, what happens? Well, you have doors, right? The doors open and close nice and easy uh, because the uh, the impact bars are in their uh, their structure. You hit that from the front, that door then jams. Okay, and now you have a jammed little cell inside. If you're uninjured, that's fine. We can take all day to to catch you out and do this and that. If you are injured, maybe you weren't wearing your seatbelt, maybe there was a, uh, um, I don't know, a gallon of milk in the back seat that came flying forward when you hit and smacked you, then we need to get you out with a sense of urgency. And faced with those side impact beams that have now been in a frontal collision and they're slammed together, the doors aren't opening, we're going to have to Cut the beams, those B posts in the middle, they're what's called a tailored blank in a lot of cases where they're super um, hardened steel wrapped with multiple, multiple layers of um, different types of metal just to have that structural strength. So where your, um, your 72 car was a tank, yeah, I got a 55 Chevy. It's tank, it weighs a million pounds. I don't want to get in an accident with that. I'd rather be in my wife's out that is going to crumple and feel like um, uh, tin around, lightweight, but that Audi is going to collapse. It's going to protect that um, passenger compartment and sure. everything else is going to blow off. So, and let them up against your Dodge Ram or mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right. All right, Chief. Thank you for that. Just one quick question. On the bottom of the page on, on that one, uh, you said, um, the, the life expectancy of these tools is plus minus 10 years. Are you referring to the new electric the new ones? Tools? Yeah. Not the old gas powered ones? The old gas mm -hmm. ones are in excess of that. They're, uh, we have multiple generations so, of the old ones. So, how many, so you, do you have one, one cutter and one spreader? Or how many do you have? Uh, uh, currently? Yeah. Well, you know, so we, if you've got your new tools, they yeah. don't in the door. Yep. If you've got your new tools. Yeah. Um, would you have one cutter and one spreader? Uh, or would you need more? You potentially, so I'm just trying to work out on this 10 year lifespan. How often are we forking out 50k? Is it every second year or every third or every five years? Uh, so the amount that I put in for was 30,000. So uh, yeah. I've uh, recently found out that the prices have dropped. This is last year's number when they were uh, brand new. Prices for these have actually dropped. They're sitting at around 22 now, 20 and 22. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, we want more. <laughs> There's um, our current inventory of hydraulic tools for auto electrification. We have, um, there's, on engine six two, there's two sets of threaders, two sets of uh, cutters. Um, on our other truck, we have one set of spreaders, one set of cutters. So that's three and three. And then we have what's called hydraulic rounds, basically the telescoping hydraulic rounds that are used for other evolutions in auto extrication. All these things um, are now being built in electric versions. So. The bread and butter of auto education is cutters and spreaders. So that's where we want to start with cutters and spreaders. And um, so we could go to So we could reasonably expect you to be coming back every year on supplementals and as, get, trying to get a new tool. Every year. Or once we're we'll asking for more and more. And I, I think, yeah, eventually we're going to like uh, a good complement is a cutter and spreader. Like we're at, we're running two trucks. We're running the the, the mini uh, F550 rescue rescue six three is what we call it. We have cutters and spreaders in that, and then cutters and spreaders in our other engine because most car accidents involve more than one car, so it's good to be able to 
uh, work um, on each at the same time. And eventually, um, should budget, can I live with the hydraulic rams? Yeah, I'll probably keep the hydraulic rams. I'll ask you for electric ones, but I can probably keep some hydraulic rams um, going for the times that we use those. But bread and butter, cutter spreader, I would like two of each eventually. And I expect them to last for well, plus or minus 10 years. Um, with this, like I put $30,000 here, uh, prices dropped to 22, I believe was the last price that I got. So cutters and spreaders, the pair, uh, 44, 45 grand um, per year should we get them both. And then this year, the next year, when you're done, and uh, for plus or minus 10 years. Sorry, and they're electric, I presume they're a cordless tool? Yep, they're a cordless tool, battery powered. So by definition, like any cordless tool, they're gonna have a, a shorter lifespan than than the old school hydraulic ones, right? Well, it's not the, um, the tool itself will uh, maintain. Uh, yeah. We may need batteries here and there to, right. to help keep. But they're, they're always a major cost. Like sometimes you just buy the whole new tool, I, I would expect, right? Uh, I haven't seen that yet okay. with uh, with these. I believe the batteries are much more, much cheaper than the actual tool. Like, oh, like okay, it's Keith. not $10,000 for a battery and 10000 for the tool. Thanks, Keith, for the explanation. Can you move on to the uh, member housing? Uh, just again, and sure, the time. Thank you. Sure. So, um, we're having a tough time, as is everybody, uh, with maintaining our uh, our membership, uh, just because most of our members, we don't have the uh, the homeowner base to support a fire department. There's just not, yeah, I think um, we've put the word out consistently time and time again. I think the public is well aware that we need um, members. We have um, roughly five active uh homeowner members, not enough for a fire department. We rely on uh, young guys that are just out of fire school that are looking to come to us to get experience. They're looking to come to us uh, to get um, hands on the tools, to have the exposure while they're trying to get jobs in career departments. We're kind of, we're a training camp um, and it benefits us. Like it's, we don't have the people within our community to do the job. So we need others. And they're coming to us already trained, already, they've done their fire school, they've done their first aid training, they're coming to us ready to go, which is a huge benefit for us. Um, but the career departments are hiring so many people right now that we can't keep our numbers. Like we're getting uh, rough three to six people per year out of fire school back into our ranks while we're losing eight, nine, 10 a year. So our, our numbers are going down and these career departments are hiring more and more and more. So the job with more of these, um, what I call free recruits, they're free career, but there are recruits. Um, the biggest hurdle is no 19, 20, 21, 22 year old guy out of fire school or gal out of fire school knows much about Lions Bay, wants to come out to Lions Bay, and then the requirement is to live here, away from all their friends, away from any restaurants or social activity that they were doing, um, wherever they're from, North Bend, West Bend, Burnaby, wherever. And it's a beautiful place, it's also an expensive place. So we have to find some way to draw the, uh, the people out here. Uh, once they get here, we have a pretty solid um, group of people. They spend a lot of time together. They have dinners together. They have they work out together, and it's a great atmosphere to have here. And people like it. But a brand new recruit doesn't know that, and they don't want to come out here. And it's really tough to get here. What this is asking for is some sort of way that we can give an incentive to get people out here, right? Get them over the um, they're going to be out of their social um, network. They're going to be uh, subject to higher than rents in New West, Burnaby, wherever they may be. Uh, so we were thinking if we can uh, help them with 
one, two, three hundred dollars a month for whatever period of time in combating their uh, their rent increases by coming out here. Possibly we'll get more people out here. Um, other departments are not doing this yet. So that kind of puts a cherry on top. Like, why would I go to Lions Bay if I can go to Surrey where cost of living is a little bit cheaper and I can uh, volunteer out there? Well, we can make it um, at least the uh, affordability a little bit closer and try to do that. So we're, we're racking our brains on how we can get more and more recruits here to come help us in this time of shortage. Will this last forever? Probably not. Um, Vancouver Fire Department is the biggest department that's hiring quite a few. Last year, 120. This year, they're on par for another 120. Next year, they say 80. Um, and these are just numbers that fire school is only pumping out so many, and they're coming straight from fire school, maybe here, maybe not, and then straight into um, uh, career jobs. So this is uh, an effort to put a, a cherry on on top of our department and our village and get these people out here and trying to trying to get them to come here instead of going else uh, to Point Roberts or to wherever else. What's the numbers uh, right now and what's the high? I understand it was at one time it was up to 40 plus. Um, I th the highest since I've been here was sitting, I think it was 32. Uh, was the highest when I've been here. Previous to me being here, it could have been higher, it could have been there. Um, we have our, our total grand uh, number, uh, I believe is 27, uh, 26, 27. I'd have to look at the roster again. I just lost four more this week. Uh, well, not this week, this month. Uh, but like I said, some of those, they, they're they contributors to the fire department, they're members of the fire department, but they're not 100%. Like, um, there's one member that does a great job in organizing all of our, our gear, our ordering our uniforms, dealing it out, doing administrative stuff. He does that, he does a great job. He comes to calls when he can, but he's not really a, a super, um, active member in going to calls and training other members, like homeowner member system, what I'm referring to. Um, so actual active firefighters, we're down somewhere 19, 20, um, if that. Okay, any questions? Yeah, um, you refer to the exorbitant price of housing in our area. I'm just wondering, do you, have you looked at, like how do we compare in terms of rental cost to other areas? that these folks might choose otherwise, do you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I never said it was urban. I said a little bit higher, like it is, uh, the North Shore in general is higher than, um, you can go on any Craigslist uh, home rental and look at uh, um, New West, Vancouver, uh, Burnaby, uh, Poco, all these other areas have rental accommodations cheaper than what is found here. Yes, there are some exceptions in every place, but we're looking uh, not to, we're looking to draw people to us, right? Um, and we're looking to help out in the areas where we've heard the reasons why they're not. Like, I've, I've got nothing to do there. There's no, I don't know anybody there. There's no restaurants to sit at. There's no this and that. Uh, rents are expensive and, um, and I just can't do it. So we're, we're talking more about a cherry and to make something attractive that's otherwise unattractive rather than saying that our rents are that much out of control compared to other places they might go. I'm not speaking on rents being out of control. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking on the what I've heard from pre-recruits that uh, I'm trying to get out here mm -hmm. and they've looked at it and say it's too expensive. It's more expensive than where I'm at. It's more expensive than blah, 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 blah. Um, so if we can help do that and give them a taste of the, the atmosphere that we have in Lions Bay and the camaraderie that we have in Lions Bay Fire, then uh, we, we tend to have a uh, like very happy, very uh, driven, very like great, great guys here. It's getting those guys here to realize what we have. Um, so 
that's that's what this is to. This is to try to draw people when they have other mm -hmm. options. And uh, you know, we don't have the base for the fire department, so we don't have the options. We need their help, and they've got lots of options. So we kind so, of have to draw. A few quick questions there. So um, they have to stay in the village or within a certain distance of the fire. What's what's the rule? So uh, if you're going to be uh, part of the Lions Bay Fire Rescue, you have to live in the village. Okay. Okay. So that does not mean like everybody works somewhere else and that's just life, right? So Monday to Friday, nine to five, we are very short here as far as the fire department goes because everybody is working. Um, but I require the, when you're not um, working, stay, come back here and contribute. Um, the, uh, the motivation for that is you came here to get experience. You came here to go on calls. You came here to train. So come here and stay here. And I, um, I ask the members when they're not here, let me know. So myself or uh, one of the other captains who tracks these things gets a phone call or a text when, yeah, okay, I'm out of the bay. And we keep a kind of a running number of who's in the bay outside of business hours when we understand that everybody kind of works. So we try to keep uh, a core here. And if uh, this side of the room says, no, we're gonna go and we're gonna do this, that, and the other thing. And then this side of the room says, hey, uh, I, I wanna go to uh, Caulfield to go shopping. And I'm like, hey, can you hold on like half an hour? Cause uh, Carl's gonna be back. And then we'll do this sort of uh, force training and they'll, they'll do that. So we try to maintain our numbers as much as we can through that sort of thing. On the weekends, we've broken the fire department into uh, four shifts, and we see and D. And the shift starts Friday at end of work, six o'clock, and then ends uh, Monday morning, six a.m. If there's a stat holiday, that gets added at into the weekend. And whatever shift is on that weekend, they have to stay here from um, six o'clock Friday night till six a.m. Monday morning. There, there is no leaving. So that keeps us with a, a crew here, no matter what. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how we're functioning. Okay. Um, so I, I was a little unclear about this, but I think I'm understanding a bit as you, as you speak. So this is really like a virtue of a signing bonus. So you're talking about six, six months, few 500 bucks, Three, two to three grand so yeah. incentive to come here. Yeah. Um, and the five guys only get paid twice a year anyway. They do. So would this be an upfront payment so they'd get something in the beginning before they get their first six month check? Is that the idea? So, uh, similar to the backhoe discussion that uh, uh, Mr. Burr and myself are going to have, we can have further discussions on uh, how to dole it and how to how to pay it, um, but we're, lo we're looking to broaden the horizons on uh, or our options to draw people. Uh, if we decide on triple this amount, we can do A, B, and C, and D. If we decide on half of this, we can do A and B or whatever, and we can work out the details. Well, this particular, I, I, I give it in details, that was one more question, but, but this particular idea is an upfront payment that would be for the first six months. Each. It was, and that's okay. uh, like- And then if, after that, then, Hopefully they love the atmosphere and they stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is that fair for the guys that are? I don't know. That's that's a discussion that uh, um, we can dig uh, dig deeper into. But uh, the intent is to uh, make uh, Lions Bay and Lions Bay Fire Rescue more appealing to these guys coming out of the fire school because they do have options and uh, we require uh, we need them a lot as well. So. That's the intent with this. Um, okay. All right, Keith, that's great. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the support for itself? Okay. So, like I was mentioning, well, there's uh, numerous reasons why uh, I've put this in. Um, new fire trucks, our current fire truck, uh, one seats eight people, the other seats 10. They don't do that anymore. Unless we want to buy a custom chassis, uh, sorry, a custom body and a custom cab, of which the price goes through the roof, it doesn't do that anymore. So this uh, cuts back to four or six, depending on which truck we get. Um, the NFPA standard for a minimum structure fire uh, response is 16 people. 
Well, if we have uh, an eight seater fire truck, which is our newest one, this is an eight seater, and then a six seater pumper, we're at 14. We can't get our members there. Okay, so we need some sort of vehicle to shuttle them, um, carry extra people. So uh, we can use uh, the mini, put extra people in that. What's um, the mini? Uh, sorry, uh, the Revenue 33. 33. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we'd be shuttling that back and forth. But our first line crews, if it's a house fire, we're going in a bumper truck. Okay, so that's one of the reasons for this. Secondly, I'm going to more and more calls. Um, in the best way to expedite, and every fire department uh, will run um, a battalion chief, a duty chief, uh, whatever rank, but it's uh, the head of the ship. He will go to the incident, do a size up, and then call the play as trucks come in. Right? Okay, you're coming in, you're taking the hydrant, you're coming in, you're doing this. Essentially, come up with a, what's called an incident action plan. Uh, that's done at everything from uh, structure fires, attack refuge calls, to wildland fires, to motor vehicle accidents on the highway. So it's not limited to just structure fires. Uh, in my personal vehicle, I've been playing this role. I can only play this role within the village because it's side streets and I drive code two or code three straight to the incident, uh, park out of the way, and call it in on my portable radio as uh, trucks are, are approaching and coming in, and this is the game plan. Can't go on the highway because I don't have any flashy lights. I don't have any um, anything that can permit me to block traffic on the highway or my duty chief or one of uh, the ship captains that's going to play this role. So having something like that that can give uh, the IC role um, a vehicle that could is uh, useful for transporting people that can be taken to emergency incidents, set up uh, an IC role. Uh, and then this just happened yesterday. There was a uh, another medical emergency in the village where the BC ambulance crew requested that uh, two Lions Bay firefighters go with them in the ambulance to administer further care uh, on the patient as they're driving code three. Well, who has to go pick them up? I do, right? So as they're going down the highway, I'm driving down the highway, they go and pull over, put their lights on, and do more administering the first aid in the background. I go by to the next exit, and I'm sitting and waiting, sitting and waiting. Sometimes, um, I don't want to get into the details of the incident, but uh, the person's um, status was okay, and then crashed, okay, and then crashed, okay, and then crashed. They need the firefighters, they don't. They need the firefighters, they don't. They need the room in the ambulance, they take the firefighters out. They put an ALS crew in, they don't. Blah, 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 all these sort of things. So I'm kind of falling being in close proximity to pick these guys up to bring them back to the bay. Turns out they got taken all the way into Lionsgate Hospital with the patient right into the ER. Um, before they got uh, released, I picked them up in my own personal vehicle and bring them back again. Uh, so it, it's an added um, it's an added reason for this resource. Now the fifty thousand is maximum. There is uh, um, other other options. I believe we could probably come up with this vehicle for a lot or somewhat less than that. Uh, but I can't guarantee that. And I'm looking at options. I'm speaking, uh, should this go forward, I'm speaking with other fire departments that are getting rid of uh, emergency vehicles. Uh, usually they have to pull out all the uh, emergency equipment and then send it to auction and then get a fraction of what it's worth. As in the, the case of our Rescue 63, that's over a hundred thousand dollar vehicle that was basically gifted to us. Um, oh, but, or something, wasn't it? Uh, the, it needed some uh, some work to customize it for us, but yeah, yeah, it was it was it was a gift. So can I guarantee that's going to happen again? No, of course not. So that's why the fifty thousand is here. 
will I be looking for that? Yeah, uh, I've, um, there are other options out there that we can get it. Um, but this here is, uh, is put forward to describe the need and uh, put some um, like an upper limit. And I'm gonna try in all my um, uh, capacity to come in with something that is much less acceptable and, and that fills the limit. Sorry, right, Chief. Thanks for that. Any questions? Yeah, quick question. So yeah. your uh, idea, it sounds like what would be ideal is a, uh, a crew cab truck. I mean, you've got 63 up there. Mm -hmm. I took a look at it. That's a nice uh, F-550 Triton. It is. Yeah, I wouldn't mind one of those. I, I, I mean, uh, you talked about gear and yeah. the need to throw it somewhere where it doesn't de uh, contaminate other stuff. Yeah. So in, 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 in many cases, or in how many cases would, would that one not suffice? To, to do the job. It'll transport your crew. Mm -hmm. And of course, this would all become a moot point if we stick with the 10-person uh, fire truck for longer, then we've got the capacity, right? Then we don't need that extra capacity. So I'm just wondering yep. why that one can't fill in and do that duty. Okay, yeah. so uh, the 10-person fire truck is the 24-year-old one. Okay. It's, yep. it's kind of off the list. The um, If it's a motor vehicle accident and that truck is coming with the resources and we're not going to like if um, myself or the incident commander is going to go to a call that that truck is going to be dispatched to as well if i come down to the fire hall get in that truck and then i take it just by myself now i've just taken four seats i'm not at the call any sooner to come up with the game plan um it's more advantageous to instead of go to the hall, park my truck, get in that truck, take that truck, and then the rest of the people get to the hall and don't have a truck to ride in, don't have the gear, don't have um, uh, all the, the needed tools to, to, to go forward with it. Um, if in the case we're having to go to Lionsgate Hospital to pick up the personnel, Again, that's um, a resource that's got all our tools on it. That's got, do I want to take that out of um, the response capability of Lions Bay to drive to, to the Lionsgate Hospital to pick up a couple of firemen to then come back? Or do I want to leave that here should a second MVA or rescue or incident come in for them to take? So the, um, yeah, I think the, the best case scenario is a quad or crew cab pickup truck where we can put uh, contaminated gear that's got gasoline, smoke, whatever contaminants on it in the back, separate from the cab, but yet still carry four, possibly five people. That would be the best case scenario. Next scenario after that, uh, an SUV or a van or something. So, and that's, um, that's my answer. All right. Any any other questions from the chief? Okay, chief. Thank you very much. We thank really you. appreciate thank you taking you. the time, and of course, uh, we value your efforts and and your whole team. So, thank you very much for walking us through that. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank any you. questions uh, before? Feel free to email or uh, call or whatever. Okay. Feel uh, full percent. And if you'll come up and <laughs> the emergency response. Items and I think you've got the emergency response program, uh, the hazard risk assessment, the ESS director's request. So thank you. Yeah, so and, and sorry, oh, Phil, go ahead. Um, uh, Mr. Blackwell was asked just to uh, we could just provide just brief summaries, so we'll just be able to have a time. Oh. <clears throat> yes, very brief. I think last time I came, I gave the long speech and he said he was shorter. You did. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, a few things. Uh, the emergency uh, program coordinator increase uh, 10,000. What, what's happened uh, this year with passing of the legislation is the province has downloaded a lot of um, responsibilities and activities to um, uh, uh, municipalities or local authorities. Um, a lot of the meetings that I've attended, uh, I've been screaming small communities, we need funding, we can't afford to just hire full-time people. Uh, they've listened to a certain extent with regards to some of their uh, funding that they provide provided for First Nations uh, uh, consultation for uh, risk assessments and that. So 
they're starting to listen, but I, I'd like to get a contingency uh, in place until I can actually get funding through UBCM grants. So I may or may not be able to get this, this money in grants. I, I don't know what they'll provide us with, but I will try to get this funded. But in, in the meantime, I think we need to have a contingency uh, to, to cover all of the activities that they require of us. And I just listed some of them here. Some of them aren't required by legislation, but other things that I've been doing outreach uh, to different um, uh, different emergency agencies. These are the relationships that I've been building over the last year to try and ensure that we've got help when we need help from, from other agencies and other communities. Uh, but the big things are um, responding to the, the provincial requirements for uh, the legislative changes. So the risk assessments, the uh, upgrades to the um, uh, the emergency plan, these types of things are going to take a lot of time, a lot more time than, than before. Um, and I think it's, oh, and then time and preparation for the UBC grants as well, like that uh, takes a lot of time. It's not my specialty, and I'm hoping to be able to draw uh, Joe down the end of the table into that as well, too, but it just takes time. So in the end, I'm asking for the increase. I'm hoping to be able to get uh, funding uh, where possible through UBC, but there's no guarantee of, of what the province is going to throw our way in that. So that's the one. How about I cover all three? Yeah, and sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, whoever you want to do it, you want to do all three and then ask questions? Uh, go ahead. Why don't you yeah. run through all three and then we'll uh, um, one. So the next one I had on here is for the ESS director, uh, an honorarium. I'm, I'm proposing a $20,000 honorarium, honorarium for um, Mary Brown, who's our current ESS director. What I've been able to look at over the years, I, I listed the rationale and what she actually is responsible for, and this is like legislatively responsible for. It, it kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, Mary's already been doing all of this, so I think you know, when I look back at the village and I see uh, people who have done ESS in the past, what's happened is it's become a much more formal role within within uh, the province and the responsibilities to, to ESS directors. It's no longer just showing up and, you know, feeding people when they need it. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of provincial meetings, a lot of regional meetings, uh, and more training and more training and more training. Um, the other thing that... Um, I'll mention about our current uh, ESS director. She's also uh, cross-trained. So in the event of an emergency and we need to activate our emergency operations center, I would call her in on that too. So I'll leave you with the rationale to have a look at that. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything else I needed to say about that. Um, the last one is funding for a hazard and risk assessment. Uh, this is uh, a, a requirement of the new act that was passed. Uh, they're, they're in the process of getting the regulation out. I've spoken to a couple uh, communities and other emergency program coordinators, uh, one in Delta and one out in uh, uh, the Fraser Valley, as to what they've had to spend to get a consultant in to do this risk assessment. Uh, obviously, a lot more than thirty thousand. I think Delta went at about fifty or sixty thousand. But I'm guessing that because of the smaller village, less uh, fewer uh, risks, that uh, we'd be able to get it for thirty thousand. Uh, after I put this in, uh, I saw uh, UBCM has got a funding stream that would potentially cover the cost of this. Um, so again, there's no guarantee that we're going to get that. So I'd, I'd like to have the 30,000 in, in, uh, contingency, uh, because it has to get done. And this is a key step into the, uh, revamping and updating of our emergent, uh, village emergency plan. Okay. Uh, any questions for Phil? Um, I was a little distracted there because I was looking at Joe's budget. Um, but you changed some numbers on me lately. So it actually had been shown that you were going to underrun this year, but I guess you hadn't paid the final invoice. Mm. Okay, so, but so these are the final numbers for the year now. Yeah. Okay. Because previously, the previous report we got was told that you weren't going to spend your budget this year, but you have done. Okay. So that answers one of my questions. 
Um, and, and just a view, you know what, if a rate change, this is just more hours, right? Yeah, I get out, essentially. Um, any of these things you listed, do you get any compensated by anyone else in any of these? No. Uh, and I, I want to jump down, he was the co-chair for the regional emergency planning. No, this this was, um, I reached out to our mayor, this, this came up a few months ago where uh, the chair who was uh, the emergency manager for um, uh, Metro Vancouver had to step down uh, and the chair became available. Mm -hmm. Nobody was taking it. Um, the reason why I sit on this committee again is to reach out to other resources and not have to recreate the wheel with either policies or resources, shared resources, that type of thing. So the co-chair became available and uh, um, I I was nominated by uh, the manager there. So no, I, I sit and I represent Lions Bay. I haven't always been compensated for that. Like I don't charge the village usually for that. Um, so yeah, no, I, I represent Lions Bay and actually I just uh, sat on subcommittee of uh, the REPC is, is what it's called and we had done a study for transportation and the transportation and the snow issue that had happened and what the outcome of that is. And I, in the credits, Phil Fulkerson, and Lions Bay EPC, I represent, and I'm not, I don't get any funding from anyone else. Thanks for the okay. question. The, the, the emergency plan, particularly, you know, I'm going to say next, the evacuation plan that we've been looking for years, is that going to happen? Happen this year? Did you have hours and time to do that with this workload? Yes, and um, uh, actually, uh, I'm planning a um, a session in early March um, for the community. I actually just sent that to. Uh, I think I copied you, Joe, and, and sent it to uh, the CAO as well too, as to when that's going to happen. So yes, that is going to happen within the budget that I have. Okay. The risk, hazard and risk workshop um, report you have to do. You're aware that we have a very detailed natural hazard assessment, right? Natural hazard assessment, the act actually stipulates exactly what needs to be done. And a lot of things have been changed but, for the risk assessment. Okay, the, the, the natural hazard assessment we had is a pretty thorough document. I don't know if you've ever looked at it. Um, and, I, and I think it might be my, I mean, I'm assuming our biggest and most common risks are natural hazards. And I, I know we have others, trucks and highways or whatever. Um, and I think that Cordelia report might already have done, I mean, it was a comprehensive document that was done on Carl Pim as a mayor. Um, you should, we should look at that when evaluating this, because I think we might be able to shortcut there and please don't double dip or duplicate effort. Agreed. I've seen reference to it uh, when I was doing some uh, research for landslides and potential landslides, and uh, I saw reference to it. I couldn't find it. I've asked for it a couple times, and I don't know where it exists. But but again, it's sure, outside, of, members it's outside of my expertise to be able to evaluate right. the actual risk. I mean, if they stipulate what the risk is, especially in different areas of the village, then yeah, it could be used for sure. I think if someone is estimating this and you gave them that document, you might, you might find out that there's a whole of hours they don't have to re Agreed. redo. Um, and then my um, last question was uh, on, on the stuff in there. No, no, I think you answered all. Um, it was about the EOC Cost training. So that, that's so she's taken their course on her own initiative, by from what I understand. Yeah. Um, and we're going to be EOC qualified fairly soon. Um, but but she wouldn't, in an emergency, she wouldn't be able to do that, right? If we needed ESS services, no. Um, but, and we do have some EOC training booked. Uh, for later this month, so uh, we'll have our other volunteer, Fred, who's who's volunteered to to get trained up as well. Too, um, I think the the key is is that it, kind of like fire, we're not always in the village at the same time, so we need to be as ambidextrous as possible. I didn't ask her to be, mm -hmm. uh, but she took the courses anyways, and she's uh, she's made herself available, and she realized I can step into ESS and she can step into EOC. However, we need to do it based on whoever's in the village at the time. 
So she, uh, you know, this requirement I think is is a, a good one to recognize the position of the ESS director. Uh, I think it's especially important to recognize uh, the current director who seems to consistently go above and beyond every time she shocks me with what she does and what she'll be able to do for us in, in the event of an emergency. Okay. Um, just one last comment. So we, we've only had one EPC meeting this year. You know, I've been asking for one over and over. It would be great to have an EPC meeting. We don't know if we have enough time in this budget cycle to get some time and dive, dive into some of these details. And if you've got a recommendation from the committee, it would be you know, probably a little more, well, not helpful, but a, a little more effective. But... Did, just a word, did, did I hear you right that uh, in March you're going to have an evacuation plan for us? Or In, in March, we're going to have a, uh, I'm planning a uh, community session where we've got uh, we'll introduce not only the evacuation plan, but I've got uh, secured uh, a gentleman from Bowen Island to come over and discuss their neighborhood emergency uh, plan that they have in place. Uh, so that's part of the emergency plan is to have our neighborhoods um, do more for themselves and copy their program from Bowen Island. So that's... Um, I don't have the dates in front of me there, but I can share that. Later. So, so but you'll be submitting a, a, a draft evacuation plan Correct. Uh, in March. Correct. Okay. Great. All right. Any further questions for Phil? No. Phil, thank you very much. Thanks Appreciate so much. everything you do. And Thanks, that explanation. Okay. Uh, okay. Sir, over to you. And uh, we've got an extensive list, so I'll let you run through that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with the big one, which is the uh, highway temporary placement. This would actually, if it was to proceed with council's blessing, be a key budget commitment, because in order to make the difference that it would need to make in time for the coming water shortage, would need to start pretty much immediately, meaning well before the budget is approved in mid April. But the number uh, remains as it is. It's a guess at $1 million. I'll remind council that. Uh, I don't know where this $25,000 number that had been budgeted 23 comes from because I recall the number to be 100,000 had been budgeted by council last year for the pre design phase or the design phase. Um, you received today, if not, it's on table, the letter from uh, the proposed engineer uh, that, under, that gives an understanding of their design fees for the project. And the number is. Um, We haven't seen it. Thirty-eight thousand dollars, which is significant for less than a hundred thousand. On the front page, that's designed the back. That's the result. Yeah, uh, our page, it was previously one hundred. It was previously. It's on page four of their letter. Plus, that, now that's the pre-design, and then uh, the uh, the detailed design construction services. I've asked them to undertake the actual delivery as well to be owners wet and to close the project. I imagine that would come in around, when I'm extrapolating, uh, 60 to 70, not 100. But then, of course, the thing has to get built. That number is not going to be known until we get beyond this $38,000 number. That would give us a scope. Oh, we have a design done by ISL. No. No, the only design we have for the highway tank is AECOM's original concept, which was to replace it's AECOM. AECOM, yeah. Yeah. So there was a, there was a tank and two PR meters, because I've seen those drawings. Correct. And so the work is, is somewhat done. They are proposing not uh, a below ground compartment, they are proposing a above ground kiosk, which is half the price. Um, the last time they did a double PRV, and don't forget that each of our PRVs is actually two valves at a time, one for fire flow, a four inch valve, and one for portable, which is two and a half inch valve, and we need two of them because there's two pressure zones below here. The last time they did one was uh, $400,000. With the design well done, well I mean mostly done by AECOM six years ago, that's an excellent start. It's almost certain that we would not go with a breakhead tank. 
I want the additional flexibility of two PRV stations so that we can play with the uh, pressures into the two pressure zones. As the pipes deteriorate, we can we can maintain fire pressure. Um, be that, that that's detail on what it would look like. I'm just telling council now that you know the the uh, the outcry that arose when we put three above ground kiosks in already. This would be another above ground kiosk, but it would be tucked around the corner, not in the public view, not on a street. It would not interfere with future plans for the space, um, which I'm pointing at. Mm -hmm. um, but there would be a, a fairly sizable kiosk there. These guys, Carollo, say that they think that the kiosk would be six feet high, not the 10 feet that we see in the in the current kiosks. So I'm just alerting you to the fact that this would be a piece of municipal infrastructure. Why? Because to make a completely subterranean cost much. So I'm asking for a million. I think we can do it for well inside that. The problem is that money to, to be of any use has to be spent now. Quick question, Carl. If, 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 do I recall correctly that the last PRVs were at about 375 apiece? Yeah. And so we're talking about two PRVs here in the elimination of the brake tank. We Yes, uh, well, so no, no need for a brake tank. Right. Have, the cost would have to include demolition of the highway tank. Okay. There's one small additional complication. When that tank was built, the land belonged to us. Now it belongs to highways. Okay, so here's my question. Why can't one have a combined single PRV that handles both zones? And presumably there'd be some economies of scale in that. Um, so and now we're looking at twice 375 and more, presumably because costs have risen. I, think I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is the cost of the demo. Like what is the cost of the demo of the tank? Right. 25,000, not much. Site cleanup. So but, if, if, if a single PRV, uh, was 375, couldn't we get a, is it possible to get a dual function PRV, get some economies of scale? I mean, how much more would that cost? I mean, it wouldn't be double the price of one, that, because the control, the control system would be the same control right. system, uh, the kiosk would be the same kiosk, uh, the site prep would be the same site prep. Right. So if, if one costs 375, two would not cost twice that. So uh, presumably, let's say we're another 50% and we're looking at 25, 30,000 for a demo, then we could hopefully come in significantly under a million. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something we're looking at? Uh, the timeline to on oh, multi. Uh, you were saying we don't know. Oh, that. that's details. But it's an additional complication. We, we need a license of occupation now, which we don't actually have because when the tank was built, a Harvey Creek had not been catalyzed and uh, they had expropriated the land for their channelization works. So that could take some time before we could even. Yeah. I, it, Again. That's why I, I like these guys because they've done this before. I am not getting much traction, but they will. So to the combined PRV again, is that something that has been discussed and getting some economies of scale? Yeah, I mean, they, for every pressure that you need, you need a separate PRV. So we need four because we need two sizes for each zone, one for fire flow, because we're obviously done, you know, we're not we're not running that level of water at all the time. So the, the, the water ball is set at a certain pressure and the fire flow is set two or three PSI below that. And when, when they open up the fire hydrant, then they both kick in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just economies on... on, on yeah, the function of the valve, actual PLD, that valve, you need still be four, but I think what Mark is saying, you could put it one bigger box with... It's it. going to be one box. Okay. It's going to be one box and, and the most important, that one of the main reasons I, I need to do this is because I need a flow meter. No, no, I only need uh, two flow meters at, at the appropriate place. And are you still convinced this is one of the places where we potentially are losing a lot of the water? Okay, so is that, there any way to confirm that? Can we do some sort of test that that really creates further impetus? Uh, that is, uh, I, I had hoped to provide that impetus today and actually had them looking at the numbers. We pulled a whole bunch of numbers uh, day before yesterday. Lo and behold, I have a discontinuity between the numbers for flow rates calculated using tank heights versus numbers calculated using flow meters. So we're in an emergency program uh, to the flow meter is either miscalibrated or the height meter or both. <coughs> and I mean significant, I don't mean it's sort of 10, 15%, I mean 100%. 
it, you know, it's, it, it might be, we, right now, when I calculate the flow rates overnight using the tank heights, I get the number that's essentially equal to the entire consumption through the flow, through the flow meter. So um, I'm about 12 hours ahead of you, and um, I will get those numbers because the entire ask to spend this million dollars is predicated on tank heights. And if the tank height meter is wrong, well, then that sends the whole thing away. So, I mean, okay. I, so if this isn't our biggest risk, there might be somewhere else we should be chasing. Okay, so I've done some of that. Maybe this is an IC meeting. I don't know if we, but this is, you know, uh, Council has a technical meeting, but, uh, you know, this is now. Here, here are the four zones that I can discriminate using available metering and, and clever calculations of slopes and flow rates and so on and so forth. I'm pretty confident in two of them, that is, using modern flow meters through PRVs. So this green zone, sorry for the, the, the lack of, but it's just the green zone. It's, a, it's, a, it's about 80 houses. Uh, the leakage rate that we've calculated through that zone is 79,000 gallons per day. Um, we're also pretty confident but of- The next to the lower line is where you can- No, that's, that's uh, up and big. Mm -hmm. The lower is 126. Oh, the yeah, so the 126 is predicated on the tank heights. If the tank heights are wrong, it, it might be one thing. Which means that we need to spend a million dollars elsewhere, and I know what that number is, but I don't have time to do that project. That is the mid in the lower, lower OGB road range. We don't have time to do that before July. So this may yet, even if we find the numbers are not quite right, this may still be our best option. The other zone that I know quite a lot about is all of Brunswick Beach and the part that's, that's normally fed by a magnesium one. There's the leakage, overnight leakage, is about 98,000 gallons a day. Our box is around, please don't uh, spread that around because the noise are not direct. So, okay, uh, that's, you, need, you need more data before we can do it. I can say that this is, I can put my hand on my heart and say this number is real. If it is, or even if the number are slightly different in terms of the actual leakage zones, we still need to do the project. Do we need to do it this year or not? Uh, Mr. Burr, we, we've got. Um, Twelve items. The cover. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you to run through them. Okay. That was the big one big, question. Yep. Regarding the lower lines Bay area, yeah. that was replaced how long ago? Fifteen years ago. Uh, two thousand twelve, I think. You know, the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. The pipeline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that's what we're assuming. It's not the pipe. It's the tank. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so that, that the whole. Yeah, and there are still stubs there. The stuff that goes to the south, that, that's the original cost line. Is it even? No, six inch line. I mean, we know very well that we have uh, uh, pipe leaks, but most of them are in fact not in the maze. They are on service lines. And when we fix a service line leak, we can tell from available metering, because we have a lot more than we used to through the new PRVs. Uh, each one is about 25,000 gallons a day, every time they fix one. So if you do the math on that, that map, you will see some of them represent only three or four weeks, and we're done. So I have to find the best ones. We are going through a massive program, probably I'm sort of good one, very spent the money, sorry, for a new type of uh, acoustic leak detection system. Okay, Carl, we got 12 items. So okay, so five we'll minutes an item, that'll give us an hour. To All right, some of them will be quicker than five. Okay. And tight water drainage, this is a perennial problem. Uh, Councillor Abbott probably knows more about this than I do. Um, it's a drainage project that's that's um, been on the list for a long time. I'm saying that we need to do it now. We are just, we know from inspecting the culvert and, and the, uh, the drain pipe last time by crawling through it, it's going to get to the point where if we leave it much longer, it's not going to be an inflationary number to fix more, it's going to be multiple more. It's going to be two or three times more because it's going to be more washouts. The number is 500,000. Can we put a stop through it down and look in this it? particular one? We're going to pull through. Okay, it's, bigger. it's four foot taller, but typically, yes, you put a rope, a crawler down there. Mm -hmm. an, and it's an old CSP code, yeah. So we can't line this or anything, no. Yeah. 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 All right. It also and goes under a railroad. Yeah. Across it. Mm -hmm. And then down through the beach. Any questions? Right. Okay. okay, the next one should be very quick. Uh, this is just to get that number back on the budget. 100% uh, grant funded when it's the CLAP. Um, 
public safety building. The number is 499. That project is ongoing. Uh, but it's a new, new year, new budget. So I'm requesting that council uh, um, re budget, I think it's the accounting speech. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a rollover. Rollover. Yeah. I like rollover. Do we generally we get the, the breakouts of these two projects based on this? We need to take for the reach for speed to date. Is it in this bunch of careless? We don't have to get now. Heavy, not now. Which was heavy damage. Okay. All right. Okay, connect to project including wayfinding signage. Uh, the processing of fairly uh, detailed report on this relatively recently from me, so I won't belabor the issue here. The number is 429-333, of which we find 25%. This is with a committee of citizens right now to scope or rescope, or potentially uh, not do at all. But if we are going to do it, it needs to be on the budget. And that's what this is all about. So 429 is the gross. 429 is gross. Yeah. That's 100%, of which we find 25. Mm -hmm. So it's a 107 exposure to. Yeah, uh, of course, we show the grant in our revenue number, our top line number, so uh, you know, we need the corresponding spend. Thank you. Sure. Right. But in terms of impact. Now, I don't know, what, uh, I have not yet been called in by this, uh, this task force, so I don't know what the thinking of plans are. I've provided them some collateral and maps and stuff, but that's all I know. So whether the recommendation will be to go ahead. Uh, there is a time concern in this one. If it's not done by 31st of December, it's never going to get done because that's the end of the eligible All good? Okay. Um, this this, no, this one thing has to be done by 31st of December this year. Yeah. Finished, completed. Finished, done. Any extension allowed? No, there was an extension. Okay. And uh, they're, they're offering a project manager. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, there's one small wrinkle without naming names. Uh, the project manager that they've tapped is uh, the, if I can just refer to uh, one of the three names of the selected engineers in the highway tech project who has not responded yet, despite three promises to do so. So I don't exactly know how assiduous they will be in their role as a project manager. Um, we would also have, it always have to come out of the project budget. Mm -hmm. Given where this is at, um, how likely would you think it would be that this could be completed by December? Oh, uh, very likely. Really? It's not a lot. I, I don't know what the scope will be. I suspect it's going to be a new bus shelter. At least that's what I'm, I'm advocating for. Quite a big one that would double as school bus shelter as well, whether or not we need it. So, you know, there, there's work to be done there, but that, that's in the hands of other levels of government at this stage. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the uh, mag weir intake reconstruction. The mag weir is, is a problem child. Uh, some say that it's cursed. Um, it's currently blocked. Uh, it's, it's often blocked. We want to rebuild it in direct emulation of the Harvey weir, which never blocks, which always runs. It's very reliable. So on and so forth. The way that um, MAG was built when, when it was designed and constructed, they have what they call a uh, separation building, which essentially is designed to screen out rocks that come in at the weir, small rocks, so they're centimeter sized rocks, which it does very well. They collect in a 10 by 10 room underneath the ground with a 2 by 2 hatch that you have to go down and empty with buckets. We haven't done that for a while. It's almost impossible. We want to abandon that building by putting a raceway or a launder or a screener or something in the open where these rocks will drop out and we can pull them out the, the machine. Will it cost three? You, you might be surprised that the budget number is three, 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 mm -hmm. three. That's to indicate that that's somewhat of an estimate. How much of an estimate? Pretty good one. Carollo is looking at this. They're extremely excited. They've already jumped the gun and started talking to people from Switzerland and other places with steep mountain streams. Um, this is a, a, a number that we think we could, there's not a lot to be done. I know what we spent at Harvey was 280 for a complete rebuild. This one is um, it's a little more difficult. But it's a little more difficult because of the pool size and, and so on and so forth, but it's smaller. Would this include a sand trap? No. No? no. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do? To we provide tried. some, fil some tried. simple we, mechanical filtration? At Magnesia, it was called the infiltration yeah. chamber. It lasted one 
heavy rain. The board completely. It's now lying in mangled pieces on the side because we haven't had time to pull it, pull it all the way down the mountain. Yeah, so a sand trap is not feasible? No. Just because of the nature, this is a steep mountain creek. In fact, I do to it here why it freezes. So nobody's asking me, so I'll tell you. It's because it's mostly froth in the pool and the foam freezes quick because it's mixed with cold air. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the one where you guys primarily are, or the guys are with the cold bars breaking it all free. Yep. Now, will this save us any water? No, but it will save a lot of time so we can go and find leaks. It's another fairly discreet, bite sized, well defined, easy to do, design it, build it. Um, I've looked at the videos and the photos from Harvey. It, it shouldn't take more than three weeks. I'd like to do it. How much staff time would it would would that save? Oh, uh, two to twenty eight hours a week. Twenty eight hours. Two to twenty eight. Depend two to twenty eight. Yeah. Which is very often OT or double OT. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the rationale to do it this year. It's because we need the time. There's some resistance about the uh, savings in OT I might add, but uh, there's plenty of OT. <laughs> okay. So another one, bridge platforms. This is a, a perennial project that's been ongoing. It's funded. I just need it carried forward. Uh, only 150,000 was funded. Everybody knew at the time that that was just the first down payment on a $320,000 project. That's what's involved. I gave you the diagram. The proposition is to use a preferred vendor to do the front street bridge to see what we're in for, to see just how bad it is. So that you know, the way that all of our uh, in-village road bridges are constructed is the concrete girders with a concrete deck and asphalt over the top sitting on two abutments. Be between the road base and the concrete girders is a gap that's not filled with anything but dirt right now. Preliminary inspection indicated that water was getting into the rebar in the concrete deck and eating it. How far back? Don't know. If it's any further back than the depth that the girder is over the edge of the abutment, the bridge falls down. So we kind of have to get to the bridge pretty quickly. Was what occurred at Cross Creek a patch or was it an actual repair? No, that's a patch. Because it's already eroding. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was hot that was hot mix and yeah. Okay. So all would be going in there as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have to do this project. Have to. To save some money, what we will we'll do maintain it next time. So yeah, do the maintenance next time. Yeah, well, <laughs> we have done some maintenance, but the, the, too late. Yeah. So I have a I have a very bad feeling about what's what we're going to find, but we have to find it because we can't have bridges falling down, and they will once the rebar is beyond the edge of the abutment. Okay. I'm hoping you're reading the financial implications or had read already. Um, much like the bottom of tidewater, this is the bottom of mountain. In the cul de sac is another failed, uh, now in this case, collapsed culvert. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, in this case, I don't even know if we can get a robot through there. It's certainly not going to be cool in this culvert because it's collapsed. Um, and, and if you go to the end mountain cul de sac, you will see it. You know exactly where the collapse is. This is where on mountain? The cultures have right at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not a ditch line for it. It's followed underground um, drainage pipe. Mm -hmm. So in storms, what happens? Where's, where's the water flowing? I was showing you. Into the ground. But it's not washing out over the cold. No, it's. Because we are so permeable, it's going somewhere. Um, when we've relied on that uh, in other cases, like here on lower uh, Ocean View, it flows into people's houses. So which is why we've got some re remediating pipes and stuff in the way. I mean, in a place like Lions Bay, you have to get the, the water not into the ground, which is the usual practice. You have to get it into the drainage creek as quick as possible, meaning line culverts. Mm -hmm. We have some differences in opinion between culverts and ditches, but to get it into a ditch would suffice. 
No, it depends on the ditch, uh, how the ditch is designed. Most ditches are, are designed to then percolate the water into, into the ground. How big is that sinkhole? It's a sinkhole level. It's about six by six feet, maybe a little bit bigger, and about uh, six inches deep. We've been patching it. So not as dramatic as the one on the uh, switchback on Bayview some years ago. Yeah. And and to the ditches, once it enters a more natural water course, let's say yeah, that is, fine, is, yeah. is downstream of houses, then we're okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That goes to the ocean and we're fine. Which presumably this this is on a dead end and it would then head for so from from there it goes down into um a little creek. Yeah. And it's actually a call it in, through the concrete wall right. of, of the of the channel. Yeah. Go we, know, we know what is coming. Yeah. That's because it's draining to the ground. Yeah, somewhere. somewhere between Martin Kalasek and that pipe, it's gone somewhere. There's four houses below there. Um, I haven't heard any complaints, <laughs> but <laughs> Um, PW24.8. Um, this is SCADA. Our SCADA is, I, I've sent council various notes on this over the course of, of the last year in, in terms of the lucky escapes, the uh, post calls, and so on and so forth. SCADA has to be updated. Our most important challenge is we have to get to tell more where our leakage is so we can go and fix it before it becomes a problem, especially this summer. To do that, we need flow meters. To do that, we need to redesign a scale uh, UI, a uh, user interface, and we need to update some PLCs, program, programmable logic controllers, because they are no longer supported. We did just uh, upgrade the operating system from version 11 to version 14, skipped a few, um, stopped working for a day because the vendor, Rockwell, had never seen this done ever before, and so they thought we were scanning our license. So we have to get something to go in manually and update all those things first. <laughs> this is quite fun. <laughs> um, yeah. But, so the main the main thing here is to make the scaler a little more powerful and real time. The ultimate uh, goal is to make it a little more controllable from a control room. Not as far as, as motor actuated valves, although we have some of those in the plants themselves, but not, not in, the, the, in the field. What I do want to do is trial some inline chlorine meters. In the new POVs, we have actuated valves, right? The one in the mountain? I thought that was the whole idea of that. It's, it's, it's diaphragm valve. It's automated. I mean, it's spring loaded. Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's got two pilots and it opens when it needs to. No, it's not. It's not it's not controlled by anything. Okay. I'd like it to be, but actually the bells are incredibly expensive. Um, in fact, the actuators, one actuator at the plant has just died, and we're going to quote one and one, but that's at the plant. So the point here is uh, three inline chronometers so that we can start comparing the results that we get midstream. Um, with, with our hand samples. Why? Because in order to be absolutely sure that we have residual chlorine at the end of the networks, we're probably overdosing a little bit at the top. Uh, when I left the office, uh, we were at 0.98 ppm chlorine. The national standard, if there, if there isn't actually a Canadian standard, there's a US standard that we adhere to, is 0.2. So we're running five times the chlorine that we need to at the top because we're not sure what it is at the bottom, especially if it's a weekend or a long weekend when we might not sample for four days. So in an abundance of caution, we kind of kind of go heavy on the story and we get complex. Because mm. <laughs> especially if you're close to the plant. <laughs> so this is all by way of just bringing us slightly more into the modern era. So 100,000 was funded last year, uh, was not spent. Um, there's a little bit left in our maintenance budget and I'm asking for another Rejiggering of other spends, I'm asking for another 105. Kind of again because it has to be done. And here's my. Would that help you reduce the chlorine at the top of it? Yes. So, uh, so, thanks. Yeah. So, there's, there's two main benefits, both necessary. One really time critical. First is to reduce the chlorine so that we can reduce it safely to get the, the overall dosage down. And the second 
is to is to find it because we'll put in three uh, clamp on flow meters. I probably should have pointed out that in the two PRV zones that we want to put down to replace the highway tank, they will have flow meters too. So that'll give us an additional discrimination in the network so we can start finding knowing where to start in point of loops. Yeah, when we have water flowing through a meter, as we do now through the upper veil of the PRV and we fix it, we can actually see it. We can measure it to you know, the nearest 5,000 gallons a day. So we just fixed one the other day that not before it wiped out somebody's driveway. Unfortunately, I think I didn't mention this before. That was 35 gallons a day. Well, that's that's quite a lot. 35 gallons a day? 35,000 gallons a day. 35, 000, yeah. 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 And that, again, unfortunately, it's service line. We're seeing a lot of service line leaks um, in winter, especially after a cold snap. And of a certain area of house that was put in with polybutylene service lines, not copper, not PVC, and not PEX. So poly B is... I believe insurers ask you if that's what you have. It's a nightmare. No, that so and then what we so again, there's a real time suck because you know it takes us a while sometimes. If there's, there's still uh, 40 curve stops we can't find, they're, they're under tar, they're under tree, they're under them. Uh, but we know where most of them are. We switch them all, and all this is in the league stops, so we know it's on the service line side, it's not on the municipal public side. But now they're out of water. So who, who lays that? Uh, you lay out this plan. Does anyone sort of give you a, a, a review or a backup on it to let to say they like this this approach or which which plan? Uh, the the testing to try to detect where these leaks are and things like that. Zone metering. Uh, we've been asking for it for fifteen years. This is zone metering. This is yeah. What's necessary to put zone metering in? Uh, until the advent of the of the two PRVs that, that have been commissioned now for about two years, uh, two and a half years, we only had two flow regimes out of the mag tank and out of the into sorry not out of the tank because that would be really nice but into the mag plant and into the hobby plant. Those are the two flows. That's how we knew how much water we what kind of consumed. So we've already got, you know, as, as you can see here, I can, I've can already got double that now because I can look at the slope of lines and work out where that's going, it's filling this tank, not filling this tank. So we need this scale work to you know, focus in on where our leaks are because one thing is for absolute sure is leakage is going to get worse, not better. The pipes are all moving a little bit more every year. And at a certain point, they're going to spring uh, moderately. We need to get there before they spring catastrophically. When I say pipes, I mean mains. The service line stuff we can we can handle. And uh, you know, this is line space, so we do it as a favor. We shut off the curb stop. Uh, we shut off their house's isolation valve, and then we put a sanitized line uh, between their house and the neighbor's house. We're going to do the negotiation so they don't have to leave their house because. So the one, this 35,000 gallon one, they spring the leak on Monday, the plumber could only get there Friday, they were planning on moving out. And so we said, no, you don't have to do that. We'll just connect it to your neighbor's house, which is one benefit of non-metered water, by the way. Don't be minds. Well, even if we had a meeting, we can make an exception not <laughs> dollars. <laughs> okay, so that's the scalar one, and this is in the sugar one. Oh yeah, I said here, the lightning strike of summer 23 almost did us in. Mm -hmm. And I was, was it not for the, 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 the kindness of our friends at the municipality of Burnaby, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Is there a way to protect from that in the future? Yes. Uh, we what does that involve? In this budget, in this hundred, this 205, is restrapping the ground straps to a grounding mesh for the last piece of pipe before it enters the, the, the intake pipe between the plant and the intake before it ends the plant. Because we think what happens is the lightning strikes around up there and it puts ground potential in and it runs down the pipe. But lightning won't strike twice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have multiple water main and drainage projects under grant application, this DMAP grant, which I'll remind us all is the best part of $10 million uh, gross project costs. Um, 
I'm still having a, uh, I check in every day or two, but it's always under evaluation. I think that's not a good thing. Um, but they haven't, everyone's still under evaluation. They haven't given anyone. I have seen some announcements of funding that sounds suspiciously like DMAC grants in terms of the terms that they use. They don't say that it's a DMAC grant. Okay. So I don't know. I've certainly not seen any explicit announcement of DMAC grants. Their FAQs don't tell you anything. Okay. We will hear when we hear. Whether or not we get it is another question, but we need shovel ready plans. This is one of them. We had multiple plans in prior years, and I've asked for them to be part. I think they total about. $2.8 million. One of them was press the button to start the construction on Creek View and Highview. What I think I want to do is to have all of these plans ready before we start construction so that if we do get the grant, we can hit the ground running. And if we don't, then we can do it in a big economies of scale of the project. So that's what the small one is. This is a design project for the one remaining piece of the puzzle. But, but we can't add to the, the DMF application, can we? I would like to believe that because it's such a long term grant eligibility period, 10 years, that they will allow some flexibility. Once we started the design effort and realized that, oh, you know, what we asked for there is not. Was this, this is the more important or whatever. Or what oh, oh, things change. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I was wondering if we got it, can we get the highway tank on it? Yeah, I mean, because we really specifically asked for the three projects we had designed at that time. Yeah, so I mean, I, I listed them here. Um, there are two other projects. The main drain on, on Highview, which the design was budgeted at 80 and the construction at 100, which, as I say in my notes here, sounds very low, even though it's a very short piece. Um, and then a main for 450 meters. I, I can hardly believe that, to be honest. Um, and then main drain on, on Review, same again. So those were budgeted and approved and not executed. I'm proposing to park those. I will keep very close track of the fact that those funds were previously approved. Um, but we need to do the one missing piece of the puzzle, 150. That's gross, net, and net would be 100? Uh, yeah, it is fine. If you want, yeah, the 50 okay. would need to be carried forward, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is the right trail rebuild. It's a, it's a straight in and out, fully ground funded. Uh, it doesn't need to be on the budget. That's why I put it there. Uh, it's start is imminent. Signs are already up. Project signs are already up. Anything more on that? No. Uh, and this, I think, is almost, it's, uh, almost the last one. And that is the... Um, the beach park. Now, since I submitted this and I've been a little lax, I didn't submit the jetty requirements. That's only been done verbally or, or supplementarily. I had asked you to remember for 100,000 for the jetty. Um, I subsequently met with the foreshore, the, with the preeminent foreshore engineer in, in BC. You've seen his, his letters in this on table. His costs alone, design costs, they're not money to design, but they're to produce the necessary paperwork to alleviate any objection from other levels of government. So kind of like an entry fee. Uh, um, the, the necessary spending to get this project approved, his costs alone are $43,000. At the low end of the retained engineer, he would have to bring. This is the jetty? Yeah. Cool. So forget the 100. Get, I, so yeah. I, a subsequent, I told you last Tuesday, one night to my new number. I'm rebuilding the jetty. Just remind me, what do you, how did you come up with that number? Well, this is Scott Christie's educated guess. I, I didn't want to uh, press him too hard because the contract was going to get Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably be wise to build a comfortable contingency. Yeah, it even is that. contingency. Yeah. There's wrinkles here because you know obviously you don't want to be ripping up the beach park twice. So it all depends. It's predicated on the rest of the beach park project happening at the right time. Um, there's more to it than meets the eye. As I alluded to last week, this would build up the beach so that we wouldn't have to sling sand. 
this is a project that over time will pay for itself over a very long time. Very long. But we don't have a cash flow issue. I mean, you know, the, the, the money's in the bank. Whether we pay for the thing over 10 years or one year, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, you're not convinced, I can tell. <laughs> the money in the bank part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've still another time been in with this project, you know, maybe it's yeah. not part of this conversation. Okay, okay. so that not in my supplementals. What is in my supplementals is this uh, plot. Again, amazingly, this one pays for itself too, because um, of the now complication of not being able to pull it in and out using uh, marina resources, um, we would have to do it ourselves. We don't actually have the resources to pull the current dock in and out. We just can't do it. This one we can take apart by ourselves, by ourselves in public works. It's a much nicer and safer thing. <laughs> this guy, Buck Christie, has told us about a much nicer boom design that's made out of 36 inch polypropylene pipe that, that sits there. It's black. The kids like to sit on it because it's nice and warm. <laughs> That would take the place of the long boom, the anchoring thing. We're already sorted out how the anchoring would happen. So this this baby costs uh, fifty thousand dollars, including all anchoring requirements and the polypropylene pipe, and pays for itself. Eventually. Sorry. So this is HTP pipe to replace the existing log boom and the dock. And the, the like, dock looks like this. Yeah. Replaces the float. Yeah. They assure me. That it will last 10 years in house sound. There's one on Bowen that has. I don't know how sheltered that is compared to our exposure. But now, with, with this addition of a polypropylene pipe, I'm pretty confident this will stand up to our conditions. And the poly the HTP pipe will be permanently anchored. Yes. Yep. What's that uh, deck made out of? Just out of curiosity, is it like a fiberglass or, or no plastic? But lots of plastic. Out of it. E e e one will take a look at those because I just uh, a side note. I know I was up in the Okanagan. They had the, this mm -hmm. type of a system. I don't know if it was the exact one, but it would shed fiber slivers. Oh, really? It was really awful. Oh really? But, but I, you know, I have no idea if this is the same. But oh, well, I'll, I'll ask them because the agent is actually in the Okanagan. Oh, really? The local agents based, uh, based in the Okanagan. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is. It was like it was it was a, a mesh type of a dot mm -hmm. that you could see through. And oh, yeah. it, that, that is fiberglass. I, I don't it, know what you're talking it, about. It shed stuff. Yes. Yeah. No, that's fiberglass. Okay. No, this is uh, uh, less slippery when wet, uh, sunproof. Kids will love it because yeah. we could even have a slide, but I can specify that just soon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what that's about. It's it's ancillary to adjunct to or the word is to the jetty required. I'll just reiterate that the jetty is almost a vital project. If we don't do it, we'll lose the jetty and then we'll lose the beach. The jetty project has the two benefits that we will not then have to remediate the wall because the waves will be greater further out. Why? Because the beach will be shallower and we want it to send sand that often. So can I ask you a question again about the jetty? Had you but you had budgeted some money for the previously the jetty or the waterfront? I never budgeted any money. There were twenty thousand budgeted last year for the wall remediation. Uh -huh. That's all. Okay. Um now I remember this Christie saying that it qualifies as pathway. And the reason I ask this and not to take away from the connector project, but if we have to spend money on that jetty to preserve that beach, that may be part of the 107 that that would qualify us for the remainder of that translate. Assuming five percent coverage, yeah, that would be first price. And and the reason I say that is because uh, uh, Ross asked me to phone up Christie before I think was when you took him, and he had said. The jetty and anything on the waterfront is definitely pathway, and and he felt that it would qualify as a translink. So just throwing that. Well, we better hear from translink. I'd like to run it by translink as well. Yes, but okay, we can ask. That's where they do it. Must that they ask for sure? They ask. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have to have a separate discussion about the connector project because you know it's right that I'm. Not dealing with it right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling TransLink, uh, even though they would like to know what's going on. They did yeah. ask, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, well, perhaps you should. I suppose I could say the last one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is to answer it. Yeah. Okay, and then the last one was um, side by side. Um, I'm not going to go on about this one. Uh, there was three hundred fifteen thousand uh, dollars budgeted last year uh, to remediate the Mag Access Road, which, uh, for those of you who've taken to it, know is in, is in virtually impossible state and really bad in winter. It's walking in winter. Why don't you want to deal with infrastructure? So we're looking at a cheaper option now. But we're going to let the road go. Placeholder options. Yeah. We're not going to let the road go. I am hoping that discussions with other levels of government come to fruition mm -hmm. to remediate the road, which is now a major regional hiking business. Mm -hmm. So until we get to that point, they say yes or no, we need a Kubota to get us up there without ripping the trucks to pieces. The plan would be to park this Kubota at the mag plot behind the gate under a, a roof. I can tell you too, Carmel, with those seven sign Kubotas, they come with a couple of attachments, including plus snowplow. Including a plow, so I, I know that. Yeah. The guys are not very excited about the ability to apply the snow uh, sidewalks with this thing, but I am. Um, it's, it comes with windshield, uh, cooler, um, coffee maker, um, air conditioning and heat. And that's all add-ons, of course. <laughs> that's not included in the total. <laughs> salt is for the, they, they spray the salt as well. And yeah, I mean, that, you can see it has a little thing at the back and um, you can carry things in it. Well, we're not looking at 25 if we're at now those bells and whistles, right? No, no. Uh, that 25 does include a, a windshield and uh, side closure. So we're just no wheels. No coffee maker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, the engine is extra. Yeah. It looks something like this. Yeah. Can we get an orange to match our uh, excavator and our skid kit? <clears throat> That's all I have. Okay. Any questions for Carl? I'm sure, there'll be lots over the coming weeks, but. Anything right now? Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Blackwell, anything you'd like to add? Um, Chancellor Abbott had a number of items for the inspection committee. I wondered if you wanted to touch on those now or? Okay, so there's nothing in the infrastructure committee recommendations that Carl hasn't mentioned already, although he's mentioned additional things. Except the pH control. Oh, right. pH control. That is on here. Oh, 100,000. It's in the budget price. It's in the first price. Yeah. There's no in your supplement? No. Some infrastructure to many supplement. What is that all about? Well, maybe I'll pick it off and then never can say the rest. So, um, our water is slightly acidic. That's not good for a number of reasons, uh, both mains reasons and leaching lead in premises. We don't use lead in the mains, but many houses in Lions Bay use lead solder for copper. You will remember, because I know everybody read the uh, water report cover to cover, we were required to put in a letter from Coastal Health warning of the dangers of lead leachate. We want to increase the pH, that means make it more alkaline, um, just because gives better mouthfeel, gives slight better color, better taste, and it doesn't mess with the metal in our distribution network and in houses. To do that, there are multiple ways. Um, if you talk to the cavalier amongst us, it's a pump on a drum. Uh, how that gets metered, I don't exactly know. How it experience with the scale system, I'm not quite sure. Um, all the way up to and including soda ash towers with augers and conveyors and slurry makers and all kinds of things. Which really you need which we probably don't need either. Um, the guys are reluctant because having caustic soda, um, sodium hydroxide is dangerous. It's, can't get it on you, but, but you do get it on you. For those of you that are blind or caustic, you know, it's, it's, it's makes your skin very slippery. And then that's just before it eats your skin away. Um, it's a difficult, Project, but we have to control pH and we will soon be ordered to. Do we do it this year? Yes, maybe. Um, because it's a bite sized project we can give to somebody. 
hundred thousand uh, dollars. I think with more than coverage for two plants. <clears throat> Most of that would be integrating of the, the the metering pump that sucks the top of caustic soda out and puts it in the stream. Integration of that to the uh, scaling system. I kind of want to use this hundred thousand as part of the scaler budget, and the fact that there's a bump on the end of it is just by the way. So that's what that was about. So we're going to be you, drinking uh, caustic soda. Well, it, it'll be barely detectable. You're you're drinking chlorine right now. Yeah, I enjoy that part too. Yeah. Um. And so you didn't put it on your list because you didn't. I just put it on my list, but it is in the budget. Yeah. Oh, it's in the budget. Yeah. Okay, it's on this list. Yeah. Okay. So we will discuss in a bit. Okay. All right. So, I mean, the rest of this report, which is the project cost over, the infrastructure committee spoke about them, came over there with, they thought the top six was, doesn't quite align with exactly with what Cole's now saying, but it's just, you know, I'm assuming everyone's read it. I'm not going to go through it now. I'll just say the difference between when this was originally discussed and produced by the committee and now is that we now know that we are in for uh, a difficult summer. Yeah. Are we going to run out of water this year? If we're ever going to run out, we're going to do it this yeah. year. And I'm not going to let that happen. So we, we have to uh, address leakage like now. Have we looked at uh, any other options? Should we run scarce on water? We're trucking water at that point, aren't we? Trucking water doesn't help. Not about current leakage rates. Well, we uh, they run straight into the ground. Uh, no, the the well, yes, I have a contingency uh, in, in the in the core budget. Yeah. Thirty six. Thirty six. Thank you. Oh, so the more than yeah. Um But that is uh, that's signage communication and uh, as fundamental as. Um, Coastside barrels of non potable water that people use to dip out to uh, replenish their toilets. Mm -hmm. Also, I mm -hmm. think that Carl and I met today to discuss a few things. <clears throat> and uh, Carl's going to have a conversation with Metro with regard to scoping the potential for extending water service. And see if that's a viable option, not a viable option, et cetera, just to give you some more data. Good luck. So, so this yeah. has been done before, right? Not the first time we've asked on this question, but right. um, we got the answer that I think you're going to get it yet. Well, we never did have to get a price, and we would not push the button on it until we got a handle on leakage because then you're paying. I don't know if the last time I looked at the price was 90 cents a cubic meter. Well, at that price, uh, we couldn't afford it because we leak 60% of our water into the ground right now, according to current numbers, with a provisor that maybe our leakage number is completely wrong because the tank light meter is. Only going to be rechecked tomorrow. But uh, yeah, we again we don't have a supply problem, we have a distribution problem. We have to fix these. And then we can start talking about supply. Well, we, we, we will have a supply problem, even if even well, if we summer, immediately the summer is going to be tough. Yeah. yeah. And we'll likely continue to have a supply problem. Because we can't fix all leaks that quickly. Can we fix all the leaks? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The municipalities is going to have leaks. 15% or so that's the, if you can do 15% we're doing fine. Yeah. Another challenge we do 100 percent A reduced snowpack, to your point, I don't know if this is where you're going, but a reduced snowpack, which is climate change. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And hydroelectric dams not running because reservoirs aren't full. Yeah. So we will have a supply problem. Oh, in general. Yeah. I mean. So that is the point of the UVC study, I'll just remind you, mm -hmm. is we're trying to understand the breakdown between surface and subsurface flows. And when there is no more surface flow, how long before the creeks stop running? Because water is coming in from the groundwater. And they have some pretty good ideas on how to do that. They've already done some isotope studies to say, see how old the water is that we're, that's coming down the creek now. And, and there's some indication that the groundwater flows are pretty good, but how long will they do that before you know the last drop at the intake level? We don't know. So that's what the UBC study is, is all about. And, and there's a budget request in my south house. Yeah. So there's there's a significantly more than we've asked for before, because I actually need to put more stream flow meters in the streams themselves to understand what the streams are doing. And we should expect that the subsurface flow will also be affected by lowered snowpacks in general. Maybe it's a four-year cycle. Yeah. 
That's what UBC is working on. Yeah. There is also, and there's so many scenarios. It's also a scenario that you can rely on the streams to the extent you can. And if there's some viability to connect up to, to connect to the metro of the water, you use that when you well, peak shaving, yeah. You wouldn't replace your existing water. Right. So, same with desalination. It wouldn't be all of our consumption, it would be to peak shave top up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's from a from Metro, which will also be short on water. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem with the pipelines when we're yeah. short, they're going to be shipped. Yeah. Sure. Cross my car. Okay, anything else, Carl? But did we cover the infrastructure committee? Well, I, I, think, Metro? I think so. I think we've spoken to it. I mean, just to support what you said. So the ranking changed somewhat. I'll just go and do what it is a while ago. I can just run through the ranking. Well, the IC, IC's, yeah, IC's ranking one to six, they, they came up with. Um, bridge and repairs was number one. All right. Um, we've, we've now moved into an operational budget, so I think we've well, council's effectively accepted that. What, number two? And number two is the highway storage tank. That, that's awaiting more data, though, right? As whether it's the first uh, place. You'll know this time tomorrow. Which numbers to believe and are also developed. Okay. That's a supplement to the budget request. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, making intake rebuild was the third one, um, which we discussed. Um, fourth priority was update the SCADA, which we discussed and has been budgeted previously and now need to top up. Um, the fifth one was um, the two small uh, water, re water replacements. So I really thought that. Uh, yeah. I realized that we still need to know what we're facing on budget new place. Actually, no. The, so the IC committee didn't come up. Our, our decision, the IC, was go do the small one, the 90 meters on Creek View Place, because we wanted to do a water main project to give us some idea of what we might be seeing when we start to do the longer ones. That's, that's, that was the IC's recommendation. Just go do that small one. So we've done a replacement. It's the shortest piece we've got. Um, and it's going to give us some, some data for what we're facing on the line. I'm not averse to that approach. The only reason that I didn't want to do it is because I've already got nine projects. And this one would be handed to the designer, the engineer, and they would, they would run with it the, the way I would have put it. Because otherwise, I'm standing at the side of another hole in the ground, so I'm making sure that they don't put the pipe in the right way around. Yeah, Were you going to touch on that approach, manager? And then the sorry, and then the last one was the pH adjustment. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's up? And if we want to. Anyone wants more idea of anything more about the pH adjustment? We could uh, invite Tony and Tony can only speak for five minutes. Um, and you'd be here for a while, but uh, but he could come speak to council and explain the risks. Um, is there health risks? Is there health risks? Yes. Longer term. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, largely linked to the presence of lead solder in in we yes. copper piping in households. Somewhat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 In, in terms of that aspect of it, it's one aspect of it. That's the health aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, at the school, for example, I believe they're supposed to run the in the morning before we need to leave in the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a place for us. Yeah. And I'm not sure how many of us do that in our house. I'm certainly not in mine. There's your water leak right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the school's probably doing the same way. Um, no, that's something I saw. Uh, the, uh, the CAC the stuff. Um, so we will listen to, do we put this into the budget, Joe, the CAC stuff? Um, so the... Let's do them one at a time. Okay, so we'll do it one at a time. So the first one is um, the fuel um, furnace, the oil furnace on the whole team. So that was one of the CAC's primary goals from the very beginning. And it's the number one you know, issue that they've been trying to get done so the one, it's the one number one climate action emissions um, preventive action we would do in the village. Was that covered by uh, a grant already? There... No, there's no specific grant to do that. What we have 
<clears throat> is we have the LG cap grant, mm -hmm. which is $51,000 a year, which, did you find out, Joe, that Ryle was on part of the third year if it's only three? Uh, LG cap, it's a, a going three years, and then there's... So when it, when it was rolled out for three years, it, it replaced the previous carrot, carrot. carrot money. Um, yeah. The problem's always been something in place, and I'm pretty sure this is either going to get extended the past three years, or they're going to go give, it, give us another similar thing. And I think they're going to start these kind of grants. Yeah. So we've got, at the end of this year, sitting in the bank, 170,000, 60,000, whatever yeah. the number is. Um, and it should, we thought in the original estimate that that was enough to be able to do what we wanted to do, was to get the oil um, burning furnace out of there and get some heat pumps in. Is that 100% uh, no, the, the LG cap? Yeah, we, 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 we yeah. use the money for what we need. We yeah. can yeah. use the money later as we choose. Yeah. 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 yeah, we use the money as we choose. Um, and in the original, in the version you got yesterday, unfortunately went to the old file, um, where we thought, BC Hydro upgrade was going to cost about 30 grand and it's comfortable in that budget. We could all do it all next year. The problem is, we subsequently, and, and this number is a bit in flux, someone been told by another um, electrician that came and viewed the site that he believes the 200 amp BC Hydro upgrade is going to cost us 150,000. So now we look to go from a project that we can actually afford um, to the one that we can't. We need another, effectively, another 100 pay. So that's kind of where it sits now. So I, I think we go back to the final action committee um, next week we have next, whatever the next meeting is. I think we're going to modify the ask to we move ahead this year, finalize the design, confirm the 200 amp power um, is going to cost us, whether it's going to cost us 50 or, or 150. Um, if it does turn out to be under the 151,000, we were at 160,000 with these cash money we already got. We'd like to go ahead and do the project now. If it doesn't, um, or at least we'll it. If it doesn't, then um, we'll roll it over another year. Yeah. Yeah. We use uh, tap into the gas tax uh, reserve. I guess that's a council decision. What do we see the gas tax being used for? So the gas tax is money we have to spend this year. Next year. Next year, and we got six hundred and seven hundred and sixty-four seven hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. So that's the council discussion. Could we chop this up? If we chop this up with something like that, and then we get another kind of cap grant, this, this or another LG cap type grant. There's several other things we need to do. We also want to do replace the whole windows, get the double glaze. There's, 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 there's going to be many uses for climate uses for this money. There will be, will be no end of projects. It's not. It's not like we won't know what to do. What other there. options are there besides? Repairing of this building. Other options for uh, climate. The climate. The, the, what other projects could we spend the money on? Just out of curiosity. Um. Well, there, there's been various suggestions. There's been suggestions to put solar panels on the roof of this building. Um. There's been uh, there's the, the energy. The, sorry, the envelope upgrades. I spoke about cheapy windows, but there's more that could be done. <clears throat> Well, we've got the fuel thing kind of sorted out, so it doesn't take care of that. There's been several asks for, um, you know, moving to electrical equipment um, in the workshop. Uh, there was a council resolution that actually said when we come to replace municipal vehicles, we should be looking at electric. Um, we haven't actually replaced one, but that's not too far away. Um, and I'm not sure if that's going to be like for like on dollars. Or what other driving factors they're going to be? Um, those are the ones that come immediately. So the whole mind. range of things that could be could be involved in the. Planning. We need. To, we want to do the committed to do. We just let it be with the. the and then, yeah, yeah, I mean, the without without is a, is a good one. Without trying to go to taxpayers and get any more money yeah. um, from the taxpayers, um, and this is the part in using grant money that we received. What would our pollution risk insurance premium go to? We got rid of the oil. Is I believe more the cost. Uh, our, well, I mean that's another uh, question um, that uh, uh, you know we need to discuss or we need it or not. Uh, so it would be currently our premium over a two-year period is six thousand dollars a year. That's the wrong mortgage. Yeah, yeah. Six thousand dollars a year. Yeah, so what is that? We're going to replace it for we're out for renewal. It's uh, about twenty grand for. And that's all related to the oil. 
think it's uh, uh, underground uh, uh, septic, like anything, it's third party liability basically. Anything we're under our um, uh, MIA uh, insurance, we're covered for uh, pollution that's on municipally owned property. If it's spilled over to non municipally owned property, we're not covered. Mm -hmm. So the tack on for the pollution coverage with um, uh, uh, this other company, um, Aon, uh, is uh, uh, to uh, ensure the municipality if there is a pollution event outside of uh, municipal owned land that's covered by MIA. That said, I'd ask Joe to follow up with MIA to see if there's any writers or any other provision that they may offer to deal with uh, the off site question. Because if that can translate into saving 20,000, I'm pretty sure council would. We're going to allocate that to other projects. Upgrading the amperage service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the windows in the hall, though, right now there there's a double glazed, and then there's a space, and then there's some um, post um, space. Sorry, piece of post space surface. Yeah. No, I don't think it, I think they're. Where did you say they're double glazed? Yeah, I said. I said. Um, Protection from bicycles. Yeah. 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 Okay. But the, the other side windows are double glazed. Um, a number of years ago. Many, many years ago. Yeah. Many years ago. I think the seals are. Yeah. Seals the seals are done. Yeah. yeah. The seals are done. Yeah. They, they were checked out. They're not working. All right. Um, anything else? Yeah. yeah. So the other one is um, the BC recycling program. So we get normally 25,000 a year, but less this year for some reason. It's uh, uh, yeah, it's just the number should be in there. Uh, yeah, it was slightly less. Anyway, around twenty-five thousand a year. Um, because we joined the BC recycling program. We obligated to spend five thousand of that twenty-five thousand um on on educational things around recycling or oh, environmental things. We have to spend that much money. The the balance. It's kind of loose of what we, we use, we can use it for. Um, the Climate Action Committee wants to use this money to set up a mini recycling program, not only the workshop, and we've discussed that with Carl as to exactly what that looks like. Um, and the suggestion is um, we are already open at certain times of the year. Um, on, on Saturday mornings, and we opened early on a Friday, but this is more focused on the Saturday mornings. Using that same window, um, putting some recycling containers down there um, for the stuff that can go in the blue bin. So the big target is soft plastics and styrofoam, but also batteries and other kind of things, all those kind of things. We've spoken to waste collection services as well as another contractor that was going to, that um, they don't know, that in the industry, the farming industry that does this kind of stuff. And it's a really nominal cost of about $300 a month. Both of them came up with the same number. And in case of waste collection services, that's just to come out of like, this will just be like a tube van, not another truck. And it will just come in and it will swap out the containers way that's set up. So it's normal. But what it also needs is we're going to sure we have to make sure we open year round. Um, we want to extend it for more than three hours. Um, I don't know. So the, this little report it just basically says, well, assuming that the staff really does it for half of the year and you use part of this budget for the other half of the year, um, that's where they came up with this you know, seventy five hundred dollar a year to fund the staff at um it was four hours, not three, sorry. Um four hours on Saturday for the six hundred and seventy. Um so this would total, if, if we split the cost of that way, and Carl, we have to talk, I mean, is that, does that make sense? Or or, or, or you, do you have that already funded somewhere else and we don't have to use, fund it out of this? I don't know, that's kind of uh, Joe and financials, but if, if it was considered in that light, we would only spend 15 of the 25. We still got another $10,000 coming in um, through this recycling program, um, which we did uh, target other uses for. Recycle it. Recycle no, it. Uh, that's bad. Terrible. <laughs> All right. Any questions for uh, Councillor Allen? 
Uh, what does the six month covered by bears mark mean? Um, well, we we already opened. We well, I guess that's not strictly accurate, Paul, because you're open for other reasons as well now, right? Um, but that program and the need to be opened during the summer was something we initiated um, with bear issues and, and made sure we open every Saturday through the summer, not only when you need to be open for something else. But that's been in place for quite a while. Yeah, most of the time we are there anyway, uh, because on Saturdays we are doing park checks because uh, the garbage was almost certainly to be full on Friday, but we don't know that until the checks are coming anyway. Friday we're there anyway, anyway. Um, I'll just point out that the recycling center is not quite the same level of effort because, you know, we're not standing by the bins making sure that people are throwing the right thing in. Whereas with the recycling center, you have to, you have to check on the paint. It's, it's the right amount of paint and the batteries are going in, the, the mercury battery goes here, and the CFL goes there, and the whatever it is. So it does have to be mapped by a fairly uh, industrious person. Mm -hmm. Those of you who have gone to the North Shore Recycling Center will burn be others. Um, but so in, in, in effect, what you're saying is we should really fund the additional man hours completely out of the piece. For a recycling center, we'll have to be there again. Okay, so we can take that out, then, but even if we double that, um, we'd still have uh, $4,000 under the 25. We'd still have enough money to do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so basically what we did look at it that way. Basically, the money we're getting from, from Recycle BC, we're going to turn into service for the village that a lot of people have asked for. It's going to keep a lot of a lot of people with fellow soft plastics and styrofoam in the garbage. We know this, right? Um, because there are not that many people actually bother to drive a pile up and drive out to um, yeah. transfer station. This that stuff all going to the ends up in our oceans. It's, yeah, it's a big issue. No, um, like that, but doesn't it increase our our our, uh, our waste costs because they do audits? In terms of the audit they inspect the load. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If they inspect the load. Yeah, they're, yeah. So they're supposed to audit. It's going to be point. They're supposed to audit this program. Audits supposedly everyone once a year, but I don't think it's going to be that frequent. Um, and they they go and speak one of your garbage loads. And yeah. if there's all a bunch of plastics and recycling, plastics and stuff that recycled in there, you get dinged. And then if you don't meet the is it ten percent contaminants? Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on the number. Um, then they start to fine you out of this fund. Yeah, then they and start pulling back. They pull back to twenty five. So we lose money. So we lose money. So once they ordered us, we're going to probably find we're guilty and we're going to lose money. If we do this, we're going to protect ourselves. Yeah. That. The other thing that um, the guy from Waste Collection Service pointed out to us, the other thing that we're going to try is, I don't know if anyone went to the transfer station about a year and a half or two years ago, maybe it was, and they were asking you to put your plastics into two separate plastic bins. Did anyone experience that? Anyway, I arrived with two piles of plastic with a pile of my gallows until I went to go out there. And I got there and they wanted me to put the the laminates or the crinklies, they call them laminates, in one bin, and then soft plastics in the other bin. And I have them all just the way they normally do, these bags of bags inside of bags. So I sat there for an hour being me and sorted it out. Because most other people who came up were just ah, this and whatever and throwing it on the ground and didn't want to participate. I put it in my garbage next Friday. I put it in my garbage next Friday. That was a good. So they cancelled it at, at the transfer station. They stopped doing it. And if you go there now, back to the old, they just mix them up. The problem with mix, once you mix the plastics, just gets burned. Gets burned to the Pioneer cement plant. So it's highly green. In fact, they burn it for energy, and, and it, well, they use energy, saves other energy on making cement. Waste to energy. All but, right. but if you separate them, and I'll be going along again, sorry. If you separate them, right, then they can recycle the soft plastics. And when we, waste collection service was suggesting to us, if we could prove that we could separate them as our part, in our we're a smaller community and we do that, they would probably give us, the recycling program would give us more money back. It would be a separate kind of fund. That's what they were trying to prove in West Van, but it didn't work. Okay. Any questions for Council Adam? No? Okay. Let's block on anything before we move over to uh, Mr. Cherkoff, are we going to get him to walk through any package or what are your on that? I don't think you know. Um, you know, I, I, given the hour and so forth, I think that the intent of tonight's been met, which is sort of back, back up the dump truck of information on the supplementals. Um, it's now the, the, with the Sister Council to sort of go through all of this stuff. It's try to, to, as you can, figure out how to prioritize this stuff. Uh, question I would have with council is 
would council feel that there's value in having um, Phil and Barrett back for the deeper dive into that discussion, or do you have enough to work with now? That's one. The second thing is, there was one other matter that I'd like to bring to council's attention, but it would need to go in, con into um, closed tonight, very briefly, but it's something that's rather important and uh, budget related. Okay, um, so you're suggesting suggesting that we move on, other than we have a closed item that you'd like to touch on, uh, and you're Thank saying you. that would be brief. Any, any questions, any thoughts about uh, adjourning the meeting, uh, moving to closed? Well, we know that during the meeting, we're going to give a reason for closing the meeting well, closed. And change the agenda. Move it into closed and, and then... It's, it's a us, you don't need to change the agenda. It's the same topic. It's just a sensitive... Okay. Yeah, so it's a yeah, it's a closed item. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it could be an open item, but I, I, I would not recommend it. Right, but it's part of the same topic. But uh, if I could get feedback on whether the council would like to have, uh, I mean, back at the table as or in which available for a deeper time next time or not, that would be. I just do offer to either we either have them come back and we throw some more questions at them or. We send emails or give them phone calls, set us time aside, do that individually. Or, yeah, or we we talk about it and then see if we need them and need to waste their time. I was thinking the same thing. I think we should have we should have a run it on yeah. our own from what they've told us. Yeah. Um, maybe come up with a the preliminary preliminary list, which might not satisfy them, and then I guess you go back and say, by the way, we weren't planning on giving you X, Y, and Z. How do you feel? And give them one more sure. sure. But I think we need to have that discussion. Okay. I, I think uh, from the staff side, I, I would like to know where the priorities lie because we have three funding options. We draw from reserves, uh, untagged reserves, not, not previously taxed for reserves, or debt, uh, or taxation. Mm -hmm. um, because as I did to last time, the, the initial taxation number you've been given, that's, that's just for starters. We now need to raise Ooh. additional funds. Could we also throw a fourth on there and defer? Uh, I would like to ask, you know, are we capable of executing on all of these projects? Because yeah. um, we seem to be struggling on even with the three at hand each uh, connector uh, pride trail. So my only question would be, do we do we defer for another year? So that would, might be a fourth option uh, and also and I think you you may want to touch on that is uh, we don't have a project manager or someone to, unless you're going to be doing all these projects so we're either hiring somebody or contracting a consultant or but if we haven't decided that it makes it tough for us to say let's move forward with with this project. nine projects or five okay. projects uh, I don't know what Ross has in mind for the, the next little session of the meeting but uh, it's not okay it's a well, the perhaps I will just touch on that in the core budget is a project manager and i have provided council some indication of what i think that project manager would look like um, and cost because i absolutely agree with you can there's no way that i can do this i do not i get yeah. calls on the, my garbage can was missed and um my my hose is leaking you know sure that's also project project manager yeah. stuff so um yeah, we need we need a dedicated project manager that we have in the core budget. Well, that would like fit out. So there's different ways to do that. One of which, you know, I guess I think self-evident. One of those ways is just is, is to uh, um, contract. Yes. Yeah. How we actually end up, you know, with what the arrangement is 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 um, to be decided. But I have a cost in the core budget right now. Right? And I would also add the final thing is every project we take not should, there should be an allotment or percentage of that budget that's dedicated to project activities. Rather, and frequently for costing purposes, PMs are left out of the equation and the money has to be found elsewhere. I'll just point out that the million dollar highway tank replacement built into that price, as you will see in the letter, is project matter. I think the one the one other thing that you need to touch on funding, but one other part of the funding that I think I'm not sure it's all spelled out unless it's now spelled out better, is the grants, their expiry dates, um, and how we can spend them. 
Oh, you might be gas tax. Anyway, maybe if we could have that summarized in one place. And what do we want to do with the gas tax? With the million dollar gift, the million dollar gift we got last year, or I would forget the name of it. Yeah. We, we, we have to spend, when we have to spend that by, that was big spend on anything you like, but I still have to report back on that one. No, it's pretty. So we keep, uh, I keep reading something about the tanks or the two PRVs. So is that sort of where you were thinking of the million portion of it? Yeah. 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 The, the, the one small wrinkle there is that I'm going to need pre authorization to go on them. Because right. you're, 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 you're looking to, um, to approve the budget by mid April. Yeah. You know? Done, dusted. Ken's point, if we consider that million dollar grant that we got out of the blue, if we consider that to be allocated to the Royal Green, the primary project, which is highway tank, um, so any money we got last year, do we have to commit the budget time? Can council not make a decision that we can fund yes. that with that, that particular grant and so that one's done and off the book? Uh, I actually, in fact, suggest that in writing at the bottom of that page. Um, there will be some re earmarking required because that's been earmarked for something else. Sure. So, so if I could sort of, there is, there's a bit of a, it needs to be factored into the larger budget discussion, but it's pre approval and you're able to do that pre approval because it's an existing amount of money. You can't do mm -hmm. a pre approval yeah. on something that you haven't decided on. But for that and any other project that's already funded, council can consider pre approving it. Okay. All right, lots to think about. Um, why don't we? One last thing, Ken, to my head. Sorry, one last thing. So, the fire truck. So, when I'm looking in the new stuff, you're talking about MFA loans on two options a 20 year loan and a 15 year loan, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and this is not because the previous thing was a talk about a lease and a residual or whatever. That was just confusing people, was it? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, oh, just so just be aware. If we get an MFA loan that's more than five years, we have to get public approval. Yeah. yeah. What I'm not clear about reading that stuff is what does that look like? It doesn't necessarily need a referendum. You could use the alternative approval process. Was that the only two options? Or a referendum. Okay. I know if you want to do either of those, yeah. <laughs> which of those do you want to do? I believe in the last round of financing, um, we did the alternative method, and effectively what it is, you put up notice, and then uh, like it was 5% or 10%. We've done one of those in this village a few years ago, and it got defeated. <laughs> that's that's the one that which, would Which I'm told very infrequently happens, but um, otherwise, I'm not suggesting it would happen on a fire truck or something <laughs> a, little, a little more contentious. And to end to end, if you go through a uh, public referendum, um, you're looking at Three, four months for approval. Okay. I'll just remind you that we did do a public referendum on the infrastructure yes. funding uh, that got ninety three percent approval. Why? Because it was people didn't recognize. Yeah, yeah. people re no people recognize this issue yeah. because they were told and certainly yeah. people stepped up. Okay, I think we'll move to uh, public participation and then uh, we'll, we'll go from uh, there into close briefly and come out of close and wrap it up for the evening. Any other comments before we go to the public? No? Okay. If there's any questions from the gallery. One question I have, yeah. um, Carl, is that, uh, you know, when the fencing at Baby Road um, Bridge was taken back, it's not ever been replaced in the, it seems like it's a safe function. It, I can address it on the very yeah. um, uh, The vendor is coming this week. Oh. To measure out, we need to request the things. Right. Thanks. Okay. Anyone in the gallery online like to ask a question? Okay. Uh, we have a motion to move into close. So moved. Second. Well, what's the reasons for the close? Uh, Rossi gave me a couple of reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, the security of the local government property. Well, no, I was like in the close. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> I've got the description, it's not the, the number. Okay. 92 B6. Second B. 
from a D? No, I don't know. Maria, probably. Yeah. Is it D? D? Yeah. Can you read it out, Ms. Maria? Uh, the security of the property of the municipality. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion, we have a second. All in favor? Yes. yes. Opposed? Carried. Okay. Um, Rena, you'll take everyone out fine. Okay, welcome back uh, to the Committee of the Whole meeting, and we've just uh, finished off our closed portion. There is nothing to report out, so from uh, that perspective, do I have a motion to close the meeting? Adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Yes. yes. All those carries. Carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. You know, we're going to score any data on local issues.